one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19T UK only entrance must be 18 or over lines close at 5 p.m. on Friday the 29th of March full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand good luck 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Hello, good evening, it's me, Jacob Rees-Mogg, on State of the Nation tonight, as Donald Trump speaks to Nigel Farage and castigates the left-wing media for spreading fake news about his remarks. Tonight, I will be revealing the extent of the left-wing misinformation and the fake news that emerges from the miasma of social media to infect the EU-loving BBC and its bedfellows. The national grid has embarrassed the Labour Party, undermining its plans to achieve a net-zero grid by 2030. But still, the plans to decarbonise the grid by 2035 will cost you £58 billion. We must abandon this unaffordable fantasy. Speaking of the green agenda, buying an electric car won't save you from speeding tickets, as the noble Lord, Go Lord Goldsmith has just discovered as he is banned from driving for 11 trivial speeding offences. But is this just the latest chapter of the war on the motorist? Plus, last week, His Grace, the Archbishop of Canterbury, met the Reverend Fadi Diab, the Anglican cleric from St Andrew's Ramallah in Palestine to discuss the war. Tonight, the Reverend Diab joins me live in the studio. State of the Nation starts now. I'll also be joined by a cerebral panel this evening, author and journalist Michael Crick and New Culture Forum fellow and broadcaster Emma Webb. As always, I want to hear from you. It's a crucial part of the programme. Email me, mailmog at gbnews.com. But now, it's your favourite time of the day, the news with Polly Middlehurst. Jacob, thank you, and good evening to you. Well, in an exclusive interview tonight on GB News, the former US President, Donald Trump, has been speaking to GB News presenter Nigel Farage, and he had a warning for NATO. He said NATO member countries needed to stop taking the United States protection for granted and that speaking plainly gets him results. If we don't pay our bills, are you going to protect us from Russia? I said, you mean you're delinquent? You're not paying the bills? Yes. Nope, I'm not going to pay you. We're not going to do it. We're not going to defend you. If you're not paying your bills, we're not going to defend you. It's very simple. And hundreds of billions of dollars came flowing in. Donald Trump speaking earlier on today.
Well, the Shadow Chancellor tonight has been setting out Labour's plans for the economy, saying it'll be a new chapter in Britain's economic history. At a meeting of finance ministers this evening, Rachel Reeves said the next government will face a challenge similar to that faced by Margaret Thatcher in 1979. She said Labour would build an economy on resilient foundations rooted in the global reality. We can no longer indulge complacency. A growth model reliant on geopolitical stability is a growth model resting on increasingly shallow foundations. The task then is to build the growth on strong foundations, broad-based, inclusive, resilient and anchored in the realities of a fast-changing world. Let me be unambiguous. There is no viable growth strategy today. Now, the First Minister of Wales delivered an emotional resignation speech today after facing questions in the Senate for the final time for him. He says he's now looking forward to life on the back benches. Mark Drakeford, who's stepping down after five years in the job, spoke with feeling as he talked about how difficult the last year had been for him after the sudden death of his wife. Me, personally, the last 12 months has been the hardest and the saddest of my life. And people will not see beyond the chamber those small acts of kindness that happen every day from people in every part of this chamber that help someone to get through those very, very difficult times. Drakeford bowing out from the Senate today. For the latest stories, do sign up for GB News Alerts. Scan that QR code on your screen right now or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Back now to Jacob. Good evening. If you were paying attention to our previous programme, and I expect you were on the very edge of your seat, it was extremely interesting. You would have heard, in our world-exclusive interview, Donald Trump discussing the misreporting of a speech he gave at a rally in Ohio a few days ago. According to the headlines in Joe Biden's re-election campaign, Mr Trump had ominously warned that there would be a bloodbath if he were not re-elected, suggesting some kind of armed insurrection. This wasn't true. It was fake news. He had, in fact, been referring to the prospects of American car manufacturers when faced with Chinese competition. There's big monster car manufacturing plants that you're building in Mexico right now, and you think you're going to get that, you're going to not hire Americans, and you're going to sell the cars to us now. We're going to put a 100 percent tariff on every single car that comes across the line and you're not going to be able to sell those guys if I get elected. Now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole. That's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country. That'll be the least of it. But they're not going to sell those cars. They're... So you see, as the man himself might say, fake news. So let's hear what Mr Trump had to say about the reporting of the incident in his conversation with Nigel Farage here. Commonly used phrase when you're getting slaughtered economically, when you're getting slaughtered socially, when you're getting slaughtered, and they use it all the time. And we have many examples, and we put out all those examples. Yeah. But that doesn't stop it. And the Trump case here is not an isolated one. Left-wing media is too often extremely careless with the truth and with impartiality, despite grandiose claims to the contrary. The EU-loving BBC has its own fact-check department, BBC Verify. Verification is all well and good, you might think. They have a friendly and professional-looking logo, the little green circle, green, of course, for piety, and they throw around terms like forensic. But fact-checking needs to be completely accurate. And at the EU-loving BBC, it's not. Mistakes are sometimes made, especially with the fast-paced nature of, of media. But this is why a good outlet will issue corrections promptly. But let's have a look at a few BBC Verify and BBC errors. Earlier this month, it fact-checked a report of Israeli troops allegedly opening fire on an aid convoy in Gaza. To verify its report, it used the account of an eyewitness. This eyewitness turned out to be a figure bankrolled by Iran with links to the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Staying on Gaza in October, the BBC prematurely reported an explosion at the Al-Ali hospital was the result of an Israeli strike. While we still cannot say with absolute certainty what happened, the most probable cause of that explosion is now widely accepted to have been an errant missile fired from 
inside Gaza, and therefore by Hamas. And this was before Israeli troops invaded the enclave. So what is the point of a verification unit that employs 60 people, no less, at your expense, if the EU-loving BBC is still prepared to spout mistruths like this to you, the licence pair, without bothering to check its sources like any jobbing scribbler on a local daily courier would be expected to do? But let's continue. In February, BBC One ran a lunchtime report on the sentencing of a murderer in Oxford. Several experienced journalists faced the camera and detailed an horrific incident that involved both the killing of an innocent man and the torture and death of an animal. Had you known nothing else of this case, the BBC would have had you believe that an adult human female had committed this wicked crime and referred to the killer solely as a woman, despite the fact that he was born biologically male. This cavalier attitude to truth is not just limited to the BBC, of course. Indeed, it gets worse because they've attacked um, Justin Webb for calling somebody who was biologically a man a man. This approach to truth matters because it becomes the self-confirmation of the virtue signaller. If I'm a good, worthy lefty and I believe it, so it must be true, this then becomes my truth and in turn devalues real facts and encourages wild conspiracy theories. The pieties of the left then create the monster it purports to despise. For when people are deprived of truth, they will believe anything. As ever, let me know your thoughts, mailmog at gbnews.com. I'm joined now by my very distinguished cerebral panel, author and journalist Michael Crick, a new culture forum fellow and broadcaster, Emma Webb. Um, Michael, you are a very experienced journalist and actually a very meticulous one. Very interestingly, in your career, you've defended right-wing and left-wing figures when you thought truth was on their side. Um, Joe Biden's office putting out fake news when he's president on a presidential candidate, it's pretty bad, isn't it? Actually, I think you can interpret the Trump uh, words there as there's going to be a blood path, literally, in terms of there being blood. If he didn't mean that, he should make it very clear... That he, he should have made that clear that he should have been... Somebody as experienced as, uh, as Donald Trump should not be using that kind of language when it can be interpreted in the way he does. In the same speech, he also lauded the January the 6th protesters as hostages. Um, uh, so th there, is the, there is the psychological link there between the, host the, 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 the protesters on January the 6th who stormed the capital and then this talk of a bloodbath. It was irresponsible language. But you wouldn't use it, but he was because you would know it was irresponsible. Was, and hit by him using it, I think there is the implied he threat. Was there is the ambiguity. He talking about the US car industry and a 100% tariff and what Probably. was happening to it because of China. Probably, but I think there was a hint in his language of something worse than but that. Don't people... and this, I mean, this is a man who has condoned, really, what happened on January the 6th, which was a violent occasion. It was an insurrection. Um, and we, and, and he, an experienced politician shouldn't use language like that. I'm surprised you take this line, because yeah. it seems to me that Trump's enemies actually make him able to get away with all sorts of things, things that may be true, because they overstate, because there's a sort of, there's a madness well, about Trump that makes people always believe the worst, those who oppose him. They can't understand that anybody would support but, him. And, 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 and there's also an element about Trump of him teasing his enemies. Uh, you know, he will, he, will, he will deliberately go further, I think, than he believes sometimes, just to fire them up and get them, get them, get, get them in, a, 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 in a frenzy. Right. So there are elements there, but I do think that that was irresponsible language and it's, and it's ambiguous. Uh, and uh, I'm, well, I'll come on to other things later. Uh, Emma, <laughs> um, I mean, it seems to me that actually the left-wing media it believes what it believes and when it doesn't fit its narrative, it's pretty cavalier about the truth. It's a sort of cognitive distortion. It's disingenuous to read into those words some kind of implication that ignores the context of what he was saying. He was clearly talking about a bloodbath in the car manufacturing industry. Well, when why you didn't look he say that the, then? He did no, say he that. He could, yes, have he, said, he could have said there'll Michael. be an industrial bloodbath or a financial or an economic bloodbath. That's what Jacob would have done because he's a responsible <laughs> politician. But Donald, Donald Trump, Trump didn't. Is he's Donald not. Trump. We've just seen him doing an interview with Nigel 
Farage. Donald Trump is known for the way that he uses language. He has a very particular way of speaking. Um, to interpret that into what he said is just, I think it's just disingenuous. I'm not accusing you of it. I, you seem like you are very committed and very passionate about your interpretation of what he said. Um, but I just think it's a sort of uh, intentionally sophistic way of um, way of trying to twist his words out of context. And if anything, actually, I think it's a miscalculation on the part of anyone who's being consciously disingenuous, because all it does is add to the narrative of those people who do support him, who think that he's being unfairly maligned. I think that's absolutely right, and that in, inadvertently the left build up Donald Trump by attacking him for things mm -hmm. that he hasn't said rather than concentrating on what he has said. And it's exactly the same with um, their attempts to, pre to use the law to prevent him from running, which was then, as everybody be knew it would be, inevitably overturned by a higher court. Um, and all that does is add credence to those who believe that Donald Trump is being persecuted. Um, and if anything, that just inflames the situation because people feel that that firstly that the that there is there is a, a system out to get them um, that is trying to prevent them from being able to democratically express themselves in wanting Donald Trump to be president again and then when Donald Trump talks about things like um, the 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 mail-in ballots um, it it just adds further credence to, to those arguments and makes it look even more as like look, he's being very convincing and to come on to the bit about the BBC mm -hmm. if you set up a fact verification unit. You've got to be very, very accurate. You shouldn't put anything out until you are certain. Um, I, I, I've had a thing from um, their statistics program where I'd used facts from the EU and they said that that wasn't the right fact. Well, that's the EU's fault, not mine. And that it seems to have a political angle to it. And the point I made uh, about, about the um, Israel-Palestine issue, again, they went to a source that was fundamentally unreliable because that's what the BBC wants to believe. That's the BBC culture. Yeah, I mean, the, the verification unit, or is that what it's called? Something uh, like yeah. that. Uh, it, it does have an Orwellian air about it, but, I mean, fact-checking is vital. And in a world of where so much of our information comes from social media, we need to be able to verify whether the video is genuine, whether it's from where it says it's from, whether it's whether it's fake, uh, concocted, whatever I forget the phrase now, uh, and the same fake with news. But you've got to make this. No, no, I don't mean that well. phrase. You know, the, the, the <laughs> videos that are. But but the the uh, it is unfortunate if you make mistakes. But we all make mistakes. One of the ones that's always haunted me. I have to confess to you, is 40 years ago I said that your father had gone to Eton. Uh, when, of course, he didn't, he went to Charterhouse. Charter and it's worried me ever since. He would have, he would have forgiven you. You're I'm a propagator of mistruths. Most of the rest of the family went to Eton, but not him. Now, um, the... Um, uh, actually, we went to Charterhouse for the best part of 200 oh, years. Oh, did you? Right, right, right. right. Well, anyway, there's another yeah. mistake. No, but seriously, obviously, you've got to be... And, I, you know, I, I have uh, been concerned about uh, bias on the left, uh, both in Channel 4 and in the BBC, uh, for quite a while. I don't think it's anything like as bad as it was. There is occasionally bias there. Partly it's the background of the people, you know, university-educated, London-based, middle-class. They don't come from places like Barrow and Hartlepool. But but I think that the bias on in this station is far, far worse. But that's why what, other, what, other, what other television channel do you see a political leader interviewing his predecessor and then in reverse? That's, cause we, that's why we've got you on for balance. Well, you, I'm, you, I'm, you, I'm doing you, a lot of lifting, aren't you, I? You, 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 you need are, a lot more. And in any case, I'm only a centrist. I'm not that left. Ma Michael, you are the little <laughs> leaven that leavens all the bread. Um, but on the BBC issue, it does seem to me that there is just a BBC view of the world, and whether it's left wing or right wing, they just think that's right. Well, one of the journalist who is the face of BBC Verify, doing an introduction to what BBC Verify is, used the Orwellian term mistruths. Um, and I actually, um, off the back of this story, went to have a listen to her podcast. She has a, um, a podcast about conspiracy theories. And it's so very, very clear that the BBC has a particular way of seeing the world. And what's so worrying about the bias is that it completely lacks any self-consciousness. It's not It's not aware of its bias. And I was looking back at an old um, Civitas report, it's a think tank where I used to work, and um, they looked at uh, BBC bias from 2005 to 2015 on the EU, just on the issue mm -hmm. of the EU, and found that un just under 3% of 
uh, guests discussing the EU were on the side of Leave. Well, yeah, there we in 2005, so, uh, not many uh, people on, believed in Leave. Because we've got some responses. In response to claims about BBC Verify, the BBC said in a statement, we stand by our journalism and reject the allegations in this piece. The BBC has not allowed access into Gaza, but we use a range of accounts from eyewitnesses and cross-reference these against official statements and footage, including from the IDF. The fact that someone has expressed an opinion on social media doesn't automatically disqualify them from giving eyewitness testimony. It is simply wrong to claim an agenda on our part and ignores much of the journalism we have done, including BBC Verify accounts of the Supernova Festival massacre. And on the question of the reporting of the transgender murderer, spokesman said, the BBC Style Guide states we will generally use the term and pronoun preferred by the person in question unless there are editorial reasons not to do so. In this case, we consider it editorially appropriate to include the fact that Blake is a transgender woman, in other words, a man, and did so across our output. We accept that it should have been included in the report on the News at One. So thank you. The BBC has admitted a mistake. There may be hope for it yet. Thank you to my most cerebral panel. Coming up, another cost to add to the green agenda. You're going to have to fork out another £60 billion to decarbonise the grid. But the Labour Party wants you to pay even more. Plus, I'll be speaking to an Anglican reverend from Ramallah in the West Bank about the war. Dubes & Co. Weekdays from 6pm get this right, we all know by now, don't we, that so many uh, NHS workers are abused by people that they're trying to help. We'll all agree that that is pretty damn disgraceful, but what do we do about it? Because now, uh, some London hospitals are looking at whether or not they should be able to ban people that do this for a year from those hospital facilities. Is that the way forward? Daniel, do you like this? No abuse, no excuse, that is the campaign? There's no other choice for most people. It's either the NHS or nothing. And if you're going to take that monopolistic power, then, then you need, I think, you have responsibilities towards people. You can't cut them off. So there are ways in which, I of course, you can bring criminal charges against them. Uh, if they've committed a criminal offence, that's fine. They might even be locked up in jail. But what you can't do is cut off health services because you're the only supplier. Well, yes, Peter? I think you can cut it off and you should cut it off. London is very different from everywhere else, and it goes back to a conversation about immigration. The majority of nurses in London are either African or Filipino, and it harks back to their nature and their culture. When you're younger, your parents look after you. When you're older, you look after them. They don't go into homes. So there's a way that a threshold of tolerance they have that is above and beyond most people. So, because I found, like, when I was younger, most of the nurses were white. Now they work in hospitals in Ascot and Somerset. London is the war zone. I have seen horrific things happen to nurses, and they stay, they show up for work. There's a protection they are owed, beyond owed. And if you abuse, if you abuse something that's offered to you as a part of your citizenship, you should be, there should be a penalty for that. Oh, for the same reason, you. if you're you obliged to use if you commit, There's no offer involved in and, the NHS. But it is, no, but there is an offer, because at there the end of the day, like, you, earn, you figure out how to get money and go private. So just because you've created something right, that so gives that's you the no, solution. no, it's easy. If you it's see, that's easy, an impossible solution they've created something people. that's kind and easy and beneficial to all, indeed. But it's a good thing for all. Do not abuse it. That simple. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. From 10 a.m. every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. Well, we've been discussing fake news, and Bob nails Mog to say, Dear Jacob, totalitarian states only flourish on the back of fake news. In the West, left-wing political regimes follow their lead. The media are crucial in countering this brainwashing, so the bias of the BBC is appalling. And Mark, using the word bloodbath is a common for most of the Democrats in the White House. Where is your speaker on that issue? 
or is it just Donald Trump is bad because everybody tells him he is? Well, sadly, I can't ask him because we need to talk about the electricity system operator, which is part of the national grid, has issued a new report saying an additional £58 billion will need to be spent decarbonising the grid to reach net zero status by 2035. This is about £1,000 per adult in Britain in the United Kingdom, exposing the lack of affordability of the project, not least because the official Commons Committee report says the government expects its goal to decarbonise the power system to require, wait for it, £275 to £375 billion pounds of public and private investment, as well as £50 to £150 billion pounds of investment in the electricity networks. But this poses serious problems for the Labour Party, this policy attempts to outgreen the Tories by pledging to achieve a decarbonised grid by 2030, five years earlier. So, if current cost projections are already this high, what would it be under the Labour Party? Well, I'm joined now by Dr Paul Dorfman, Associate Fellow of the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex, as well as Chairman of the Nuclear Consulting uh, Group. Um, Professor, thank you very much for joining me. Um, tell me, do you think this is affordable? Well, about 87% of all new power generation capacity worldwide uh, last year, 2023, was renewables. So all energy institutes, organisations worldwide say quite clearly that renewables will do the heavy lifting for net zero for, for the energy transition, that we need to ameliorate uh, the climate crisis. Now, the UK has vast wind resources. How to deploy that? Well, via the grid. And in fact, according to the grid's own numbers, it works out to be about 20 to 30 pounds per household. But, but we don't make any difference to the climate, do we? Because we're only 1% of emissions, and China is still increasing its emissions, and America hasn't decreased them. So what's the point? We just make the British poor. Well, the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, says we need to cut by 2030 to have a, a hope of, of 1.5 to, to, to try to stall the worst of, of climate that, that we're seeing. So, um, as it were, every little helps. And we need to be in the forefront of this. Why? We've done our bit. We've cut our emissions and other people haven't. And we're making our electricity, our electricity, 44 cents per kilowatt hour against 17 cents in the US. It makes us fundamentally uncompetitive globally. We're doing quite a lot, but in terms of those emissions, it's uh, we're talking about those emissions generated in the UK rather than the emissions of the total emissions that the UK uses. In other words, production worldwide. So that number that you just quoted varies uh, quite considerably. The point about this is is that we're facing a climate crisis. I mean, th this is the reality. This is where we are. This is really what is happening. So uh, anything that we can do uh, helps, and there's no okay. question about. Thank you. Sorry to be, be very brief. Um, we rather overran on the last segment. So thank you, Dr. Paul Dorfman. Uh, one area that's been hit hard by the expansion of the grid is Lincolnshire. And I'm delighted to be joined now by the leader of Lincolnshire Council, Martin Hill. Um, Mr. Hill, thank you very much for joining me. The countryside of Lincolnshire right, is going to be desecrated by these enormous... Um, 164-foot pylons along 87 miles between Grimsby and Walpole in Norfolk. Surely people living in Lincolnshire don't want this. Uh, we certainly don't want it, and uh, we're talking about 420 pylons all the way down Lincolnshire coast, right next to Lincolnshire Wells, which is uh, an area of outstanding natural beauty. So, um, obviously, the, the power that's been will be generated by a new wind turbine farm out in the North Sea. We'll have to come ashore somehow, but uh, our view, if this is inevitable, uh, why not just lay the cable on the seabed uh, and not have these pylons basically discovering the whole of uh, the east coast of Lincolnshire? It will be even more expensive is the problem, isn't it? And what we need is cheap energy. All economies grow on the back of cheap energy. So this green fanaticism is just making us um, poor. I think there needs to be an honest debate about the uh, the green agenda uh, because, you know, all these extra costs which aren't mentioned 
when we set off on this uh, program, I think we're uh, sort of all coming. The chickens are coming to roost now, and uh, uh, obviously the you know importing gas from abroad instead of uh, using the gas that we have under our feet in in UK, huh. Nottinghamshire, Lincolnshire, in my case, is uh, would seem to be at least should be considered. And uh, so, not only do we are we getting a huge cost, we're also getting huge disruption and our understanding is this line of pylons is only the start and there'll be further pylons uh, across the whole country because the trouble is the uh, the, net, uh, the the national grid is based on coal farm coal uh, uh, coal power stations in the in the midlands and uh, obviously the power's got to get from the sea to the southeast basically which is where we're going to suffer well, um, you're a democratically elected politician. What do your voters want? The voters, certainly the, there's been a lot of uh, anti, uh, people against this, uh, certainly around the areas which are affected. And I think like a lot of the things which are green, I mean, as a council, we have pursued a green agenda. We reduced our carbon emissions, similar to the government, 40 percent, by doing sensible things which are actually saving money as well. But uh, I think in the future, as it becomes more and more intrusive, when people realise some of the costs of this agenda, there needs to be a sensible debate of how we can in the future find the power we need uh, at yeah. the same time protecting the, the environment in other ways. Well, thank you very much, Martin. My sister, my current sister, Nunziata, lives in Lincolnshire, so I'll have to ask her when she's next back on the programme. Yes, I'm aware of that. So I, I do know you know Lincoln quite well. Good. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming on. And while we're on the subject of green fanaticism, I'd been remiss if I didn't mention Cambridge University, which has decided it's going to decarbonise too. The university will halt funding from fossil fuel firms after a campaign from students criticised the £19 million it had received from oil giants like BP and Shell. But the ethically conscious bureaucrats of Cambridge don't seem to be all that consistent. While money from oil giants is unethical, more than £2 million in funding from a Chinese state-owned military aerospace company doesn't seem to be a problem at all. Well, I'm joined now by my panel, Michael Crick and Emma Webb. Emma, you were at Oxford... Oh, no. Michael was at Oxford, Emma, you were at Cambridge. Do you want to defend your old university? I do not. Um, and actually, I think this news coming straight after um, we saw, a I think it was a student, somebody slashing um, a painting of um, Balfour. I think that this can only... Um, it, irritate student activists who might take it upon themselves um, to try and bully the university um, into um, taking up their activist demands. And no, I think that this, not just the Cambridge story, but the other stories that you just discussed, I think this is a historic act of self-harm. There are people living in this country who are living on their overdrafts, who can't afford to feed their children, who can't keep a, a roof over their heads. This is taxpayer money that's going to be spent on what I think is frankly, a scam. I think net zero is unachievable. And I think you were absolutely right to point out that we have reduced our carbon emissions. And I think it's reasonable to try and have a cleaner energy system. But it's not reasonable to have this ideological commitment to net zero, um, particularly when it's nonsensical, as countries like China and America are definitely not pulling their weight. Michael, I know you don't agree with that. Go on, fire up in favour of net zero. And would you take donations from BP and Shell? Well, on the latter, um, I, I remember discussing this issue when I was on the governing body of another university. And it's tricky because sometimes these companies, BP and Shell, are actually doing huge amounts of research into alternatives uh, to oil and gas and, and, uh, and carbon emissions. And... Uh, and we need that kind of research, obviously. I am totally committed to net zero. I think we should, do, we should work as hard as we possibly can to achieve net zero. Britain has done a brilliant job so far in setting an example to the world. We can't just say, oh, well, we're never going to achieve it by 20, the target by 2030 or 2050, so let's give up altogether. We should try as hard as we can. And if we say, all right, well, we're giving up, and the Americans... You know, under Trump, it will get it would get worse. Uh, they say they're giving up. Then the rest of the world say, "Oh well, we won't bother either." And the the weather will continue to get worse. 
Hurricanes and floods, There's islands no will disappear. There's no evidence that hurricanes and floods have increased, as you know. Even the IPCC says that. Well, the, the severity of, of, of the, the weather throughout the world. You're saying the weather conditions we are suffering. Weather always changes, the but huge, the IPCC the has been clear. There's been no increase in hurricanes in this country, and we've actually got fewer forest fires than we had 40 years well, what ago. About, what about the huge temperatures, increase. not in this country, throughout Europe, throughout Africa? Large parts of Africa can't grow food anymore, uh, and, and, and that will then, of course, lead to even further mass migration, uh, which you are very concerned about. We're all concerned about. All right. Uh, I, I think, you know, you're always going on about the importance uh, of inheritance tax and, and leaving something to your children. I don't the want world my, you leave to your I children well, my, may not be very good. I don't want my constituents to be cold and poor. That's the long and short of it. Thank you to my panel. After the break, we'll be discussing another aspect of the Green Agenda, the war on the motorist, which has gone after one of its own, the environmentalist and former London mayoral candidate, Lord Goldsmith, Zach. Plus, we'll be exploring the small but fascinating Anglican community in Israel and Palestine. Hi there and welcome to the latest GB News forecast from the Met Office. Cloud will thicken for many of us over the next 24 hours, turning damp, but the rain does ease later on. Now we're going to see a weather system approach from the southwest, associated with an area of low pressure that's forming at the moment. And that's going to push a finger of rain into much of Wales, southwest England, and then overnight Northern Ireland, southern, eventually central Scotland as well as parts of the Midlands and East Anglia. Now, the far southeast, likely to stay mainly dry, 10 Celsius here, and the far northwest of Scotland, also dry with clear spells, a touch of frost as we start off Wednesday. That's the best place for any bright weather first thing. Elsewhere, a lot of cloud cover, those spells of rain continuing through the morning, turning heavy for a time across parts of Wales and northern England before eventually the rain fragments and pulls away, but it does tend to stay damp across this central swathe of the UK. A few showers elsewhere, but actually Western Scotland, Northern Ireland brightening up nicely, feeling fresh here, but feeling warm in the southeast where there will be some afternoon sunshine and highs of 18 Celsius. Thursday's a very different day. We start the day with outbreaks of heavy rain across the northwest. Strong winds moving in as well. The rain spreading across Northern Ireland and Scotland during the morning and early afternoon. Thickening cloud across England and Wales, but the rain not arriving here until much later on. Friday, a return to sunny spells and blustery showers, the heaviest downpours towards the northwest. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Well, we've been talking about the national grid and Cambridge refusing money from BP and Shell, and the mail mogs have been storming in. Graham says, give the people two tariffs, green and fossils, no subsidies, let them choose their credentials and pay accordingly. That's a very good idea. We'd all go for fossil fuels. Mike, other than Michael. Um, Jacob, to pursue an H2 economy would certainly reduce the need for armies of pylons, saving billions wherever one would look e.g. to use our existing yellow pipe gas no network. Now, I agree, I'm interested in hydrogen. And um, Paula, Paula, a very special message from Paula. Hi, Jacob. Please would you say hello and good evening to my dearest dad. Hello, dearest dad, David from Whitstable. Yes, he is such a fan of yours, and this would make his day. Thank you so much. Well, 
Bad David, I hope I've made your day, and thank you for watching The People's Channel. Speaking of the Green Agenda, there's another agenda also run by the eco-zealots, which is the war on the motorist. And make no mistake, driving an electric car will not see you exempt from this tyranny. One man who knows this all too well is former London mayoral candidate Zach Goldsmith, who has now been banned from driving for a whole year after 11 trivial speeding offences. And while I obviously don't advocate speeding, some of these offences were patently absurd, such as when he drove at 28 miles an hour in a 20 zone and 48 in a 40. What's even more bizarre is the pompous, puffed-up magistrate cared to mention that motorists who break speed limits emitted more harmful emissions, oh, 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 even in hybrid and electric cars, as if that had anything to do with the matter. Well, I'm joined now by my most cerebral panel, uh, Emma Webb and Michael Craig. Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Mocking the judiciary, you're <laughs> some pompous magistrate. And I'm, uh, if I were in the House of Commons, I wouldn't be allowed to, but I'm allowed to when I'm not no. in the Commons. Uh, I mean, this, what seems to be so fundamentally unfair is that the system of catching motorists has changed, but the penalties haven't. So there's been a massive increase in the number of penalties issued. When this point system started, it was that you had to be pulled over by a policeman. And policemen only pulled you over if you'd done something pretty silly. So the chance of getting 12 points in three years meant you were quite a bad, irresponsible driver. Now, just sort of pootling along a little bit above the limit, poor Zach got caught in temporary speed limits, which are a monstrosity. And then suddenly you find you've lost your licence for a year, which is a huge imposition. It's just not fair. Well, you described uh, the offences as trivial, but the, the, the one you just uh, mentioned, him being done at 28 miles an hour when the limit is 20, that is uh, more than, you know, n n well, it's 40% above the limit. That is not trivial. But 20 is a silly limit. Well, uh, I think if you were hit by a car driving at 20 miles yeah. an hour, you might survive. If you were hit by a car driving at 28 miles an hour, you probably and wouldn't. That's, and that's... And, and it's, it's, so safety concerns... But that's a very good here. argument for 20 outside of school. It's a terrible argument for safety for 20 on the Cromwell Road, which is just to annoy the motorist by um, the Mayor of London. Well, I think that overall, lower limits, because after all, they are, if, you, if, if, if your electric cars are seen to be exempt and so it gets so complicated, I do think 20 mile an hour limits are a good idea right. on the whole. So Michael Craig yeah. wants us to go back to having red flag in front of your car. <laughs> Typical so, <laughs> so socialist, he wants the red flag out. Emma, um, uh, this is really a war on the motorist and it's become too onerous and losing your licence for relatively trivial offences is surely disproportionate. We've just been talking about net zero and I think motorists do feel that they are besieged on all sides. There are so many ways in which motorists are being caught out and tripped up and that actually it's not entirely reasonable. Now, of course, you know, you shouldn't speed. That's... No, Fair enough. Shouldn't. Nobody's advocating for that. But what you need is a reasonable application of the law. You need common sense to, to rule the day, essentially. And I, and I think that motorists are, are, will feel, and I think quite rightly, that they are being targeted because, um, particularly with ULES is one example of this, but there are other measures that have recently been brought in. There is also the recent news of... Um, of private companies that have been issuing yes. um, 35,000, I think it is, 35, I think that's the correct number, um, parking tickets a day costing people billions. Well, it makes a lot of money for the DVLA. But we can move on to more of that subject because the powers of councils have been expanded. So there's as many as 10 million households now face the tyranny of more fines for traffic offences, very minor ones. 85 highway authorities will now have the powers to fine motorists if they're caught stopping in yellow boxes or making illegal U-turns and such other trivial misdemeanours. There seems to be yet another case of more proof that the war on the motorist is merely a money-making scheme, especially considering many of our councils are practically bankrupt and desperate for more of your money. Well, Emma, do you want to continue? on that point. Well, I think that per I mean, it perfectly illustrates that it's it mounting that, that, as I said, I described it as, as motorists feeling as if they're besieged on all sides. Now, I can't drive. I will at some point learn to drive. But I'm sure that there'll be very, many people in my position who will feel dissuaded. And I think that that's what the intention is. ULES is a good example of this. Low traffic neighbourhoods are another example. And particularly if you need to drive for your trade, um, all of the restrictions um, and incentives and disincentives towards electric vehicles. This is adding extra costs for people, particularly tradesmen or taxi drivers. 
people feel as if drivers, I believe, feel as if they are being persecuted. And I think it's wrong because the people who are affected most by this are working class people. Well, I, I do think we need to do more to get people out of their cars and onto public transport. And, I mean, I've been done for yellow boxes. They're blooming impossible to understand and, you know, you get stuck and all of that. And, and, it, and it feels unjust. You've, and the fact that the money goes to the council and our councils are stretched is sort of, you know, a compensation. Uh, but, I, you know, people are driving cars that are a lot, lot bigger than they were only 20 years ago. We need to get people out of their cars, onto buses Why? and onto they trains. they like going in cars? Well, because, because, because we need to well, achieve that. what are you going zero. to do in North East Somerset, in my <laughs> constituency? Well, uh, with the, 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 it's impractical. The, the, well, I'm not saying that we... Obviously, you do it much more in London, which is what we're talking about here, and less in rural but areas. Isn't there and a of fundamental... Course, <laughs> and, of course, with the decline of our bus system, that doesn't help. But isn't there although, a fundamental although, principle yes. of justice? You say it feels unfair, yes. but as a motorist, you mm. are guilty until you prove yourself innocent, and that turns justice yeah. on its head. Well, uh, it, it is, yeah, it is. But you can imagine what the legal system would be like if it was the other way round. Oh, but that's a terrible argument. I, I know it is, but you can't be unjust for the sake of convenience. What are you saying that we don't punish people at all for any of these offences? No, no, if it's then not, people would ignore no, but the offences. You offenses. don't treat motorists like they're a piggy bank, and that's what's happening. And you can say, oh, the reason why we should do this is because of net zero, but that's just ideology. That's just an ideological point. I, You're I, using I, net zero as if it's an axiom. I, I think actually, at times when our councils are falling apart and can't well, that's do incompetent. basic... Sorry? That's because they're incompetent. It's not because they're incompetent. Most councils are more competent than the government that you used to belong to. <laughs> <laughs> no, more competent than central government. Well, and, and, it's the, and wildly it's, inefficient uh, in their uh, use of uh, public money. Before we finish, I'm, 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 yeah, go I'm going to get one point before yeah. we finish. Yeah. And that is that the if the offence is worth prosecuting through the courts, it's worth prosecuting. If it's not worth prosecuting through the courts, it's not worth prosecuting. And that's the fundamental inversion of our justice system. Well, I, I, I agree that's not satisfactory. We've got agreement from right. Michael for at least half a second. Oh, you cut me off. <laughs> I've cheated. So isn't so this sorry. what you started with? Trump being turned out when you say out of context. All right, sorry, I've taken, I've taken Michael out of context. Coming up, I'll be speaking to one of the very few Anglican Christian clerics in Ramallah, Palestine. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> On Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11 p.m. Muslim prayers at train stations. Are we becoming a secular society? Trump hints that he'll deport Prince Harry if he becomes president. Nigel Farage will join us live for behind-the-scenes reaction to his interview with the big man. James Bond. Is it good that the new Bond is a straight white male? A Labour government, trans kids at schools, asylum seekers getting a monthly allowance, 20 mile an hour zones everywhere, and an obsession with identity politics is what's happening in Wales, paving the way for Keir Starmer in Downing Street. Don't miss Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11 p.m. Be there. Headliners, tomorrow's papers tonight, every night from 11 p.m. Is a debate on gender really a far-right issue? Far-right. I'm so bored of that phrase, you know what I mean? Like, anyone who talks about... Anyone who acknowledges that there are two sexes is suddenly far-right, because that's what, that's what Hitler and Mussolini were all about. Um, this, this question from Shirley is, of course, about Labour. They've been accused of being undemocratic because they pressured a pub into cancelling a debate, and this debate features Kelly J. Keane, who's been on this show a couple of times, uh, and she's a campaigner, and she was just on the panel, and then they got a letter saying that they couldn't do it because Kelly J. Keane apparently attracts far-right groups. Now, they've tried this trick before, but because some awful, ghastly neo-Nazi types turned up near to an event that she was holding in Australia, they kind of tried to blame that on her and suggest that the two were the same thing. They weren't. That was an opportunistic group turning up to... They're not... Neo-Nazis aren't pro-feminist. <laughs> they're, they're not pro an event called Let Women Speak. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> New Zealand's uh, TV uh, blurred her uh, touching her zip because they said that her touching her zip was a far-right uh, dog whistle because she's... she's She's making that symbol. Yeah, but when she, she wasn't making the symbol. Wow. She was just adjusting a zip. Yeah. And, and all, also, this isn't a far-right symbol. I mean, that's, that was incredible because she obviously wasn't making that symbol anyway. She was just adjusting a top. But this New Zealand uh, news channel blurred out the hand so that they could <laughs> pretend that it
said it was some horrible ghastly. Yeah. I mean, well, she's, 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 we, she's talked about having voted Labour in the past. She's yeah. so not far right. But also, I mean, even if she were right wing, which she yes. isn't, why would they be banning a panel where there's a discussion about an, one of the most important issues of our day? What well, did Labour playing at here? They're anti democratic, aren't they? They're just kind of playing whack a mole with things they don't like. I think yeah. maybe I'll write to the pub and say, I do want to see Kelly J. Keane there. Yeah, but it's... they won't listen to you well, if you no, say that, will they? Because you've got the unfashionable opinion, Chris. Well, I'm the unfashionable workplace. <laughs> I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Welcome back. Last week, His Grace the Archbishop of Canterbury held a meeting with the Anglican cleric of St Andrew's Church in Ramallah, Palestine, in which the two discussed the war in Gaza. The Archbishop published a statement following the meeting in which he expressed sorrow and regret for the misery and suffering in Gaza and the West Bank. This meeting illuminates the little-known fact that there is not only a Palestine Christian minority, but also an even smaller Palestine Anglican minority, roughly 7,000 people in the Diocese of Jerusalem. In total, about 47,000 Palestinians are Christian, making up about 2% of the total population. Sometimes, amidst the current conflict, it's easy to forget that the West Bank is the home of the birthplace of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, in Bethlehem. Well, I'm joined now by the Reverend Dr. Fadi Diab of St Andrew's Anglican Church in Ramallah, Palestine. Thank you so much for coming in. And it's very appropriate that you've come from the West Bank and Bethlehem is in the West Bank and today is the Feast of... St. Joseph, so the Holy Family, very much in our thoughts today. And your community must feel very um, besieged at the moment. It must be very hard to minister to them. Thank you for having me. I think uh, you're right. The Palestinian uh, community in general and the Palestinian Christian community in particular uh, do face uh, existential uh, threat and really a uh, hard uh, time during these these six months. But of course, this is not like you know a, a six month uh, uh, hardship. It's a long history of subjugation, long history of oppression, long history of uh, military occupation, and that's why I think. Uh, uh, it's, this is, this is a, a, a tough cycle in that history of pain and suffering. And the, as, we, as, as you mentioned, as we celebrate the Holy Family, uh, we continue to care very much about our families, uh, our, our parents, our children, and, and what the future is bringing for them. And I, I was looking up St. Porphyrius, who was the Bishop of Gaza in what about the fifth century, and that he had great difficulties in um, dealing with the pagans who were very opposed to him at that time. Do you feel a link to the early days of the church in your ministry to having to cope um, with so much difficulty and yet finding in your flock such faith? Well, I think we, before even the 5th century, I think we need to uh, go a little bit back. Uh, we uh, relate very much to the uh, uh, person uh, and minister of Jesus, who himself suffered under colonial uh, structure of the Roman Empire. And we, we, we understand very much how the first disciples themselves uh, were persecuted and then were, they, they scattered around. Um, and actually, uh, in, the, in the first four, four, five centuries, the Christian communities uh, continued to uh, uh, be, be persecuted for their faith, but they maintained strong uh, 
uh, faith uh, and and the love of God uh, through Jesus Christ. And it, it is very similar today. As we maintain our faith, as we continue to live the love of God in Jesus Christ, as we continue to witness in Christ, of course, we continue to face hardships, like uh, r political hardships, economic hardships, uh, social hardships, cu cultural hardships. And that is why to be a Christian in the Holy Land in such a situation is not easy. Indeed. And this week, I mean, Palm Sunday comes on Sunday, the grand entry into Jerusalem of Christ, and then, of course, all that happens in the following week. It's a time both of trial, but with great hope at the end of it. Does your flock have that great hope, or are you in an almost perpetual Lent? Well, I think, you know, uh, one of the bishops in Jerusalem on Christmas Day said, uh, Christmas in Jerusalem is like Good Friday. Uh, how sad the city was then. Uh, and I, I continue to, to, to describe, even though... Uh, the Christian community will never lose hope, but it's going through uh, uh, a deep despair um, during these very times. Uh, they're very distressed, psychologically depressed, um, uh, economically, uh, you know, struggling. Uh, as you know, for now six months, uh, their permits of work were revoked. Mm -hmm. uh, they can't move from one place to place, lots of restrictions, a lot of uncertainties about the future, a lot of fear. So there is this, you know, walking the Via della Rosa, mm. uh, these, these times, but deep in our faith, deep in our hearts, we know that the resurrection means that uh, God has the final word, not the human power. But you're so important as a leader, of the faithful, it must be a great pressure on you to have to cope with so many difficulties and also the, trying to keep the hope for people that there will be better days with all these difficulties that are going on. Of course, of course. I mean, we at the end, we're human beings. Uh, there, there, there are times when we uh, feel weak. There are times when we, as clergy, as leaders of the community, we feel weak. We feel abandoned. We feel, uh, you know, angry, uh, which is which is normal. And and that's why I keep saying to myself and my, you know, uh, colleagues and community, it is this faith that Christ walks with us through these trials. It is this faith faith that uh, Christ wouldn't abandon his flock, his faithful community that keeps us moving. But also it is, you know, brothers and sisters uh, in Christ around the world who continue to encourage, sustain, support, uh, reach out. Uh, I think both uh, the, the, the concrete faith in the love of God in Jesus Christ, who himself walked through the Via della Rosa, continues to walk in the pain of his community, but also right. it's the Christian community at large that doesn't forget those in pain. Right. Well, thank you very much for your amazing witness and for joining me this evening. Thank you. Um, that's all from me. Up next is Patrick Christie's. Patrick, what have you got on your bill of fare this evening? So, Network Rail have decided to remove this controversial Ramadan message from their concourse. This story is absolutely bonkers. We have the inside track on it. Nigel Farage joins us for the behind-the-scenes goss from the President Trump interview. We look at Labour's record in Wales as well. And Bond, is it right that he's a straight white man? <laughs> well, always talking about Bond is interesting. Um, that's all coming up after the weather. I'll be back tomorrow at 8 o'clock. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg. This has been State of the Nation. Oh, and the weather in Somerset, fantastic, glorious, wonderful, perfect. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hi there and welcome to the latest GB News forecast from the Met Office. Cloud will thicken for many of us over the next 24 hours, turning damp, but the rain does ease later on. Now we're going to see a weather system approach from the southwest associated with an area of low pressure that's forming at the moment. And that's going to push a finger of rain into much of Wales, southwest England, and then overnight Northern Ireland, southern, eventually central Scotland, 
as well as parts of the Midlands and East Anglia. Now, the far southeast likely to stay mainly dry, 10 Celsius here, and the far northwest of Scotland also dry with clear spells, a touch of frost as we start off Wednesday. That's the best place for any bright weather first thing. Elsewhere, a lot of cloud cover, those spells of rain continuing through the morning, turning heavy for a time across parts of Wales and northern England before eventually the rain fragments and pulls away. But it does tend to stay damp across this central swathe of the UK. A few showers elsewhere, but actually Western Scotland, Northern Ireland brightening up nicely, feeling fresh here but feeling warm in the southeast, where there will be some afternoon sunshine and highs of 18 Celsius. Thursday is a very different day. We start the day with outbreaks of heavy rain across the northwest, strong winds moving in as well. The rain spreading across Northern Ireland and Scotland during the morning and early afternoon, thickening cloud across England and Wales, but the rain not arriving here until much later on. Friday, a return to sunny spells and blustery showers, the heaviest downpours towards the northwest, along with gusty winds. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I'm Martin Daubney, this is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. It's 9 p.m. I'm Patrick Christie's tonight. Ramadan, Ramadan. The pushback against the perceived Islamification of Britain and King's Cross Station backs down. Also, ability and security, which is what I offer as Chancellor of the Exchequer. Don't we have proof about how awful a Labour government would be? And. If they know something about the drugs and if he lied, they'll have to take appropriate action. 
Nigel Farage is live for the behind the scenes info on the Trump interview. Plus. Yes, my name is Bond. James Bond. My name is Bond. James Bond. Uh, Mr. Bond. James Bond. Is it right that the new James Bond is a straight white man? On my panel tonight is GB News star Nana Aquia, Tory MP Jonathan Gullis, and author Amy Nicole Turner. Oh, and what the heck is this? I'm proud to be British. Aren't you? Get ready, Britain. Here we go. Will Labour turn Britain into a hellhole? Next. I'm Polly Middlehurst with the latest from the GB Newsroom. And tonight, the former US President Donald Trump has hinted he could deport Prince Harry if he wins the US elections. In an exclusive interview with Nigel Farage this evening, he said the Duke of Sussex won't be getting any special privileges if he lied on his visa about drug use. If they know something about the drugs and if he lied, they'll have to take appropriate action. Appropriate action? Yeah. Which might mean... Not staying oh, in I don't know. You'll have to tell me. You just <laughs> have to tell me. Uh, you, would, you would have thought they would have known this a long time ago. Mm, you would. But I thought they were very disrespectful to the family, to mm. the royal family. I'm a big fan of the concept of the royal family and the royal family. Now, I'm a little prejudiced because I thought the Queen was incredible. Donald Trump speaking to Nigel Farage earlier on this evening. Well, in other news tonight, the Shadow Chancellor has been speaking to business leaders in London, outlining Labour's proposed economic and industrial strategies for the UK. She said Labour would build an economy on resilient foundations rooted in the global reality. We can no longer indulge complacency. A growth model reliant on geopolitical stability is a growth model resting on increasingly shallow foundations. The task, then, is to build for growth on strong foundations, broad-based, inclusive, resilient and anchored in the realities of a fast-changing world. Well, in response, Economic Secretary to the Treasury, Bim Afalami, said the UK doesn't need to go back to square one with Labour. Well, I'm afraid all that it showed is that Rachel Reeves couldn't say anything she'd do differently because everybody knows Labour do not have a plan. All that they offer are unfunded spending promises which will lead to higher taxes and lower take-home pay for ordinary people. We're sticking to our plan. What does that mean? It means inflation falling, wages rising, and sticking to this plan will mean that we're able to deliver the long-term change the country needs not to risk it all and go back to square one with Labour. The supermarket giant Tesco has lost an appeal in a row with rival shop Lidl over the use of its yellow circle logo. Lidl had accused Tesco of deliberately trying to ride on the coattails of Lidl's reputation by using a yellow circle to promote its club card scheme. Tesco denied infringement and took a challenge to the Court of Appeal last month, but in a ruling today, the court dismissed Tesco's appeal, meaning they'll now have to switch to a new club card logo within the coming weeks. Britain's roads are at breaking point as pothole numbers reach an eight-year high. A report found just 47% of local road miles were being rated as being in good condition, with 36% adequate and 17% rated poor. The Asphalt Industry Alliance said councils are expected to fix around two million potholes in the next financial year. The amount needed to fix the backlog, though, of local road repairs has now reached a record £16.3 billion. That's up 16% from a year ago. That's the latest news. For the latest stories, do sign up for GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on the screen right now or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. All right, welcome along. Let's do this. So, Labour's shadow chancellor, Rachel Reeves, told you today that you can trust a Labour government. The country is at a crossroads and there will be a choice at some point this year about what direction we go in. And it's a choice between another five years of chaos and instability with the Conservatives, like we've had for the last few years, or stability and security, which is what I offer as Chancellor of the Exchequer. 
Well, we know what a Labour government looks like, don't we? It looks like Wales. Here is what a Labour government has done to Wales. They have the worst performing education system in the UK. They are the worst for reading, maths and science. They will, however, use young school children to advertise Wales to asylum seekers. Not only is Wales beautiful, there are loads of privileges too, such as free education, free healthcare and a great community as well. The best things are... The Welsh Refugee Council. The Refugee Council is a safe place for refugees and asylum seekers to adapt to their new life. You can get help from the Welsh Refugee Council by having English lessons and getting £40 per week. And you have the opportunity to get a visa. Welsh Labour decided to give some asylum seekers a taxpayer-funded £1,600 a month allowance and public money to fight deportation. The Welsh NHS is a joke. More than 30,000 people have waited more than two years for treatment. One of the country's biggest health boards has been in special measures for six of the last eight years, plagued by chaotic mismanagement. It's been through seven chief executives in 13 years and four since 2019. At one point, it was paying a cost-saving consultant nearly £2,000 a day for nine months in a deal that allowed him to work from his villa in Marbella. All of this despite the Welsh NHS receiving £1.20 for every pound received by the English service. Welsh Labour have an obsession with wokery. In 2022, the Taxpayers Alliance found Mark Drakeford's government had spent almost £9 million on woke jobs, which it defined as those with one of these words in the title. Equality, diversity, inclusion, well-being, carbon, net zero, climate, race, LGBTQ+, sustainability, green, culture or art. They are obsessed with identity politics. The new First Minister got stuck into it straight away. Not just because I have the honour of becoming the first black leader in any European country. That's the same Vaughan Gathing there, who was Health Minister during the Covid pandemic, where Welsh Labour introduced some of the longest and most draconian lockdown rules ever. He was found to have turned on disappearing messages on WhatsApp, so they were untraceable. But everyone remembers that they barricaded shops and even declared that baby clothes were non-essential items so people couldn't buy them for a while. Like all good totalitarian socialists, the rules on social gatherings didn't seem to apply to Mark Drakeford and his quest for diversity. Happy Diwali, Mark. On a similar note, Labour's Mr Drakeford slammed second homeowners, but it turned out he owned a second property. He said it didn't count because it was only a chalet. Welsh Labour flirted with the idea of a four-day working week and universal basic income. But how is unemployment in Wales under Labour? Well, 23.2% of those in the Principality aged between 16 and 64 were classed as economically inactive. And then, of course, as turning every 30-mile-an-hour zone into a 20-mile-an-hour zone, despite half a million people signing a petition against it, and a cost assessment saying that it would result in the economic hit of £9 billion over 30 years and will cost 33 million quid to implement. So, when Rachel Reeves says that you can trust a Labour government, presumably she isn't talking about the health service, education, public finances, transport, borders or civil liberties. Let's get the thoughts now of my panel. It's GB News presenter Nana O'Queer. I've got Conservative MP Jonathan Gullis and author and broadcaster Amy <coughs> Nicole Turner. Jonathan, I'll start with you on this. I mean, we do know, don't we, what a Labour government looks like? It looks like Wales. Well, Patrick, first of all, we just need to replay the monologue. I'm sure Conservative HQ will be clipping that, and I certainly will be later on, to let everyone know what the cost of Labour will be. And let's not forget, Sir Keir Starmer, the famous flip-flopper, said this back in 2022, Welsh Labour government is the living proof of what Labour in power looks like. God help our United Kingdom. They will, Jonathan, just sticking with you on this. No doubt make the point, though, uh, that you lot have made a right horlicks of it as well, though. <laughs> they can say what they want, but the reality is that this bunch of uh, clowns in their big tent, uh, uh, you know, busy trying to cancel GB News being played in <laughs> the uh, Welsh Assembly, because apparently that's worthwhile, rather than actually dealing with the issues that matter, like, as you said, improving the life, out chances, life chances for young people by improving education outcomes. It's a damn disgrace that the Welsh Labour government for far too long have been allowed to get away with this, and it's good that we are putting a spotlight on this here on this channel, and members of Parliament who are Conservative colleagues of mine in, in Wales, 
Wales are also shining a light on it. And there's lots of questions to answer. And the reality is that, you know, whilst, of course, the Conservative Party will face some criticism, I don't deny that, you know, we had a pandemic, we've had the war in Ukraine, but we also have borrowed about half a trillion pounds right. to give the wraparound support whilst having a Welsh Labour government, as you say, okay. locking up babies' clothes. Yeah. No, no, um, I mean, the idea of what a Labour government might look like, they say, well, we don't know. But I think, I think we do have an idea. And mm. from what I can gather, it does look like an even worse functioning NHS, even worse functioning education system, kids advertising your country to asylum seekers, uh, and 20 mile an hour zones everywhere. Well, that, that, that and the whole sort of trans issue, which I you know, have to point out, that in Wales, of course, um, they are allowing many of the schools, there was a report done, and uh, all, many of the schools were enabling and allowing uh, social transitioning and allowing that to happen without parents' uh, knowledge. And, you know, it, it's this sort of ideology that concerns mm. me. And, I, and, I, and I, you know, because I have a, a young child and I'm worrying that and, and my son, Ivory, he is one of those that really, he's like a sponge. He absorbs everything and he gets hooked and fixated on one thing. And if, if somebody were to slightly persuade him or tell him that, oh, maybe he's in the wrong body or, uh, you know, go along with his uh, notion mm. that he might want to be a, a girl. Because uh, I think he's probably got a bit of... Maybe he's got a bit of ADHD or something like that. I can see that he's, he's obviously got some... So he's, he's neurodiverse in, in some way. Um, I, I know he, he's malleable and sensitive. And I worry about governments that allow and enable this push with gender ideology to young children. And that's what worries me uh, in particular about the Labour Party. Well, when you look at Rachel Reeves, they're doing her best to say, hey, look, you know, you can trust Labour here with the country. Uh, well, can we, given that we can see what's happening in Wales, Amy? Well, I think it's better to look back at what happened in 2010 when we had our last Labour government. The NHS was in the best shape it's perhaps been. That's um, news to me. Patient satisfaction levels were incredibly high. Um, the, we had safe and legal routes for migrants. Oh, uh, thank general God. satisfaction in the country. <laughs> thank God for that. Well, look at what's <laughs> happening more now. Mass migration. Look at what's happening now. Jonathan, Free movement. have you yeah. ever heard no, let me finish those it. in glass houses? You talked about clowns in a tent. You're the clown in the tent right now oh. because your performance oh. and the Conservatives. She's at She's the moment, practicing. it's the oh. country that nobody wants. We're ready for change, and that's because of 14 years of failure. Labour HQ did a great job there of getting Amy to do the line at the end. Let's be honest about what a Labour government will look like. One minute they want to borrow uh, for this green investment, £28 billion, ditch it because it might bring a negative headline. They're against what we're doing on the economy, but choose not to vote against it in the House of Commons chamber last week and instead allow the SNP to be the main opposition and say they would copy the tax cuts that we've just enacted, but yet say somehow that they'd be better. They say that they want to deal with France, that's already done, that they want returns agreements, that's already done, that they would have safe and legal routes, that means free movement under Labour, but yet they will cancel the Rwanda plan, which is the big deterrent, and they continuously the vote against it. How well, much is the Rwanda well, plan? Let's not forget that the, the, the Labour ministers were hilarious, because they're out there saying, oh, well, it's only going to take 150 people. If they read the report, the Rwandan government said themselves, there is no cap on the scheme, so they can't even read a press release. God help this country if those clowns opposite manage to get I mean, into I power. I think as well, Lana, there is a bit of an obsession, to say the least, with identity politics that seems to come with Labour. We've just seen Vaughan Gething there mm. again, obviously, uh, you know, g going in straight off the bat, talking about race and ethnicity, etc., in a way that a lot of people regard as being actually completely pointless when it comes to politics. Some people would argue that maybe that's to try to take the heat off the actual politics, which, as I outlined earlier, have been pretty woeful. Well, the thing is, the Labour Party have proved that they're very, very good at taking the heat uh, off the actual, what we're all focusing on, and allowing little, you know, ideology, gender ideology, mm. and pushing. And I mean, you saw how they pushed party games and all, all the sort of tiny little minute things to kind of get rid of Boris Johnson in a way. They were behind all of that. Even changing parliamentary procedure to, to try to silence um, their own party so they wouldn't show the division. What worries me about the Labour Party is that they are really divided. I mean, you've seen mm. their whole pro-Palestine stance. You saw the party literally break up over the whole issue with the ceasefire. Yep. And, and I come, I'm very concerned about their gender and, ideology. And, and, and on that, Amy, under... The Welsh government in Wales, we've got schools there not telling parents if mm. their child is changing gender. That, you know, that's a that's, problem that's now because that could be an, that could be nationwide, full-blown I mean, nationwide. And I really under. hope that it is. What? Because it's the oh, best did you way hear the CAS report? Uh, yeah, I did. I read the CAS report in full. They said it's not a neutral act. Exactly. Social transition is oh, not a neutral act. Do you know what else isn't a neutral act? Is ignoring a child when they present gender well, dysphoria. It's a mental illness. So that is not... 
you, you, you think social transitioning is good, though? It's not just me. Words. It's g the global consensus <laughs> so you're of every medical body that agrees that gender-affirming oh, care... Well, of course I, I think a lot, of, a lot, a lot of people mm. hear gender-affirming care, which, which actually affects... Amy, you are talking absolutely you rubbish. How can I be talking rubbish when I didn't even finish the sentence? Well, because I've got to stop I mean, you that's... in the middle of it, because it's just All right, well, go on, finish it. I, I, do you know what? I'm absolutely done because if you're just going to sit there, throw your head back, you're going to interrupt me every other second. I never can finish a sentence. What's go the on, point go on, of my? What's we'll the we'll point? get on with it then. You talked about no. your. You talked about you having. No, no, come on, finish it, finish it. No, do you know what? If I'm going to be ridiculed like I this, I was just laughing. What you said. I, I went. I went. No, look, it's we fine. don't. We don't want anyone to be ridiculed at all. I know that there are a lot of strong views, especially when it comes to gender issues as well. So, I think the question really was that. In Wales at the moment, it appears that they have a very lax approach when it comes no, to telling No, they don't have a lax approach. They have, about... they have an approach that we previously had. We've brought in these new rules about mm. gender ideolo ideology, which has changed the school guidance for the worse. Any expert in this field, anyone with a trans child, is incredibly concerned about the way we've gone in, the, in, in England. Wales have this one okay. right. Not all children live in a supportive house. Not all children okay. live in a family where you accept, where they're accepted. They need to have not the confidence... All but they need to have the confidence anything. and the support that they can tell a teacher and they You've don't instantly tell their parents. And, that, that can be and you would vote damaging. for a Labour You've government if they said they were going to do I that. I think they're doing a better say, job right. than can we've I got say here. That no, everything right. is never all. So what you just said there is right. true because no, nothing is all. Well, then, Patrick, not, then they shouldn't well. tell very all parents. You're interrupting me. This is very important. Amy said that this was happening before. It wasn't. I was a school teacher. I was a head of year. Believe me, if a child had said that they thought they were in the wrong body, I'd have informed those parents immediately. And then those parents might not accept their child's in danger. Danger. All right, Danger all right, all right, all right. You will all have a chance to contribute again throughout the course of the show. Thank you very much for a lively start. That's Nana Aquir, of course, Jonathan Gullis and Amy Nicholson. Look, don't miss out on your chance to win our Great British Spring giveaway. Tech treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash. It's an amazing prize and it could be yours. Here's how you can enter. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax free cash, text GB Win to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Lively start. Coming up in the head-to-head, -head, James Bond producers is set to pick straight, white, male British actor Aaron Taylor-Johnson for the coveted 007 role. So, have they made the right choice by rejecting a woke overhaul? Editor of 007 magazine, Graham Rye, and author and commentator Nicky Hodgson, they do battle very shortly. But next, Nigel Farage gives the lowdown on his big interview with Donald Trump that exclusively landed on GB News earlier today. The former US president laid down the law to NATO. I'm not going to defend you. If you're not paying your bills, we're not going to defend you. It's very simple. But he also said a heck of a lot more than that. We'll ask Nigel about the reports that he could become Trump's trade envoy, Obama meeting Rishi Sunak in Downing Street, and the BBC apologising for calling Reform UK far right. It's Patrick Christie tonight. We're only on GB News. is GB News, Britain's news channel. Now, I'm sure you have seen this video that went viral this week, and if you I haven't, really well, I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, this is a firefighter leaning on a fence whilst watching a trapped driving instructor's car sink <laughs> in four feet of flood water. Looks very comfortable there, doesn't he, just leaning against the fence? Just chilling, just yeah. relaxing. <laughs> uh, yeah, there were two... Uh, so there were, in fact, two Essex fire and rescue crews, an ambulance and a police car parked near the sinking vehicle, but they wouldn't enter the water because they had to wait for specialist crews who were trained uh, for the water depth. Uh, well, two people who weren't going to sit back and watch were these two, Jack and Danielle Price, who took it upon themselves to rescue the submerged driver. And Danielle joined...
joins us now. Very good morning to you, Danielle. And you are a hero, an absolute hero. What happened in this video? Make sense of it for us. So we were filming in the area for our YouTube channel and we've seen the fire brigade come through. I was actually out at five o'clock in the morning with my husband, Jamie. We, we know it always happens there, as you can see. Um, and it was clear. We've seen the fire brigade come through. We've followed them. And they're just standing around as if nothing's happened. Um, in the clip, it says um, he's fine. He's, he's, he's on his phone um, and then sort of walked away. But what they failed to realise is when my partner actually opened the door, as you can hear, he's on the phone to the... the the sort of the emergency crew in panic thinking he's going to sink um so we could not just sit there and watch um he's absolutely terrified yeah poor bloke well done you do you reckon this is health and safety gone mad it is because although i do sympathize with them they are so red taped but surely sort of common sense has to kick in as open the door Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. It's Patrick Christie's tonight, only on GB News. Now, coming up, were producers right to choose a straight white man to play the next James Bond? But first, in a world-exclusive, GB News presenter Nigel Farage sat down with Donald Trump for a wide-ranging interview earlier tonight, and the US presidential nominee certainly did not hold back. One of our recent exports to you uh, is Prince Harry. No-one knows the truth. What did he put on his American visa form. If they know something about the drugs and if he lied, they'll have to take appropriate action. Now, the massive debate back across the pond is NATO. We're not going to defend you. If you're not paying your bills, we're not going to defend you. It's very simple. Our country's gone to hell, and it's gone to hell fast. November 5th is going to be the most important day in the history of our country. Well, I'm joined now by Nigel Farage himself. Well, Nigel, you are looking spectacular, by the way. Uh, Nigel, fantastic, fantastic interview there with, uh, uh, with the Don. Um, I've got to ask, initially, what was he like behind the scenes? Can you tell us a little bit about what that was like that we didn't see on camera? Incredibly relaxed, um, very chatty, uh, quite concerned about Kate, the Princess of Wales, and how the press have been giving her a hard time. Um, delighted that Piers Morgan had gone from Talk TV. He was very, very pleased about that. Um, and afterwards, you know what, even though he was busy, he hung around, he did photographs with all the crew and all the GB News team. Um, he even signed a $20 bill uh, for somebody, a young lad who's called Andrew Jackson. Uh, the former president Jackson being on the bill. Um, yeah, he was just really, really relaxed, down to earth. And when you think what they're putting him through, what the American judicial system is putting him through, uh, he just has a resilience that is almost unbelievable. I was going to say, I'm quite surprised he's giving away a $20 bill at the minute, to be fair, given everything that he's got going on. Um, but rumours have been swirling 
Nigel Swirling, that you could be in line for a very big job if Trump returns to the White House, possibly as a trade envoy to the UK. Well, Did he offer you anything? Before I get to that, the oh. clip you played a moment ago about NATO was the wrong part. The single most important part of the whole interview is when I asked him if Poland's invaded and NATO members have paid their bills, is America there to support? And he said yes, 100%. So politically, that was the most important part of the interview. Now, as for me, well, depending which Sunday newspaper you buy, you know, I could be staying at GB News, I could be coming back to take over reform, I might make a bid for the Conservative Party, or I could be the British ambassador for a Labour government in Washington or an envoy for Trump in London. You pay your money, you take your choice. Do you want any of those things? Oh, Patrick, for goodness sake. Honestly, what a ridiculous question to ask. I am just a humble news presenter at GB News and very happy with life. All right, OK. Look, getting on to some of the actual content of that interview that you mentioned there. I mean, Trump was very, very wide-ranging in what he said there. And do you think that there is a chance that... We've got a lot of conversation over here at the moment about our defence spending, right? Do you think there is a chance that Trump could essentially save the West from Russia? Is that actually... You know, a realistic way of looking at things, do you think? Uh, well, I do think it is. And, and, you know, the world was a much safer place when Trump was in uh, the White House. You know, we had negotiations with North Korea. We had the Abraham Accords between Arab states and Israel. And I am absolutely of the view that Putin would not have invaded would not have invaded Ukraine had Trump been there. Now, you know, if he takes over the reins again at the inauguration next January, it's not going to be easy. You know, it is not going to be easy. The world's in a very, very tough place. But the one thing we learn through history is that peace comes through strength, not through weakness. And ultimately, all of the negative comments he's made about NATO members, mm -hmm. actually, he's strengthening NATO. OK, look, a little bit later on in the show, I'm going to come on to some of the stuff he said about Prince Harry and the royal family, so I'll leave that for later on. But a bit closer to home where I am now, Nigel, the BBC has been forced to issue a grovelling apology after they branded Reform UK as far right in a news report a few days ago. Has the Beeb shown its true colours here, Nigel? I'm afraid so, yes. We saw these tricks being played with... Um, ..and I understand that Richard Tice had to go to law to get this corrected, but corrected it has been, um, and let's hope that no other media outlets make the same mistake. Do you think there is more of a rush to call people far right than far left? Well, I think, I mean, according to the BBC, almost everybody's far right, aren't they? Uh, any new party that rises up or new government that gets elected gets called far right. Um, we never hear far left. We never, ever hear the phrase far left. Mm. Um, look, Nigel, I want to ask you a bit about... Uh, you were with one former president today, but another former president wandered into Downing Street, actually, and that was Barack Obama, wasn't it? Now, he was in town and he managed to squeeze in a little visit to Downing Street. He met with Rishi Sunak for over an hour to discuss AI, the Obama Foundation. Do you think this is a good use of our Prime Minister's time? Uh, probably not, no. Um, I wonder what else was discussed. I wonder what else was discussed. Uh, it's very, very interesting. We did speculate, Trump and I, about what might have been on the agenda. Um, look, you know, he is a former president of our most important ally in the world. So, actually, truth is, he should be accorded some time. Could you just go into a little bit of the, uh, the, the Trump stuff, the Trump speculation? I mean, how does he feel about Rishi Sunak? How does he feel about the idea of a Labour government as well? You know, what, what's, his, what's his views on that? Because, let's be honest, he might, well, he might, be, de he might be dealing with Labour, might not he? Yeah. Well, he always liked Boris Johnson, and he wanted to like Boris Johnson, but he, he's sort of incredulous that Boris was elected as a Conservative but governed as a London Metropolitan Liberal, uh, and he sees that as the reason for the downfall of the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom. I did ask him about Keir Starmer in the interview, and it was clear there has been no connection of any kind at all between Sir Keir's team and Donald Trump's team. My worry is less, I suppose, Keir Starmer, but more David Lammy, uh, who, of course, is the shadow foreign secretary, might well get that job in a Starmer government as the foreign secretary himself. Uh, and he's described Trump as a woman-hating neo-Nazi. Um, not, I would suggest, a great place to start that relationship.
No, so, so I suppose taking that to his logical conclusion, uh, a Labour government... I mean, we've had Joe Biden, who clearly doesn't like us over here in Britain, running the show in America for quite a while. Uh, and then you could end up with Trump, who really does like us, but then we'd have a British government that hates him <laughs> under Labour. So it's not really great for transatlantic relations, is it? Yeah. <laughs> Which is why we need the right ambassador. It's why we need somebody in Washington, D.C., if Trump takes over, or when he takes over, I think, we need a person... We don't need somebody with a first in PPE from Oxford who's been in the Foreign Office for 30 years. That's the last thing we need. We need someone who can actually talk to Trump and act as a negotiator. They're our most important ally in terms of defence and in terms of trade, uh, and we've got to pick the right guy. That's not a job application, but we must pick the right guy or woman. Look, Nigel, can I just say thank you very much for your time this evening because I know that you've had a heck of a lot to do over there and to squeeze us in has been, uh, you know, we're very, very grateful for that. So thank no you for problem. your time. All right, that's Nigel Farage, the GB News presenter, who did just bring us that Donald Trump world-exclusive interview. Do make sure that you go to GB News on YouTube and online, etc. or if you've got us on catch-up and record on your telly or however you're watching us, we are everywhere, and go back and watch all of that in full. But there was a little bit of that interview that I did not decide to talk to Nigel about. Why? Because we're going to have that coming up. Prince Harry, he's in Donald Trump's crosshairs. No one knows the truth. What did he put on his American visa form? If they know something about the drugs and if he lied, they'll have to take appropriate action. Well, King Charles's former butler, Grant Harrell, joins me live soon with his expert take in the Royal Dispatch. But next, it's our head-to-head. -head. And it's reported that James Bond film producers are set to pick... Shock horror, by the way, everyone a straight white male British actor, Aaron Taylor-Johnson, for the coveted 007 role. So have they made the right choice by rejecting a woke overhaul? Editor of 007 magazine, Graham Rye, and author and commentator, Nikki Hodgson, they do battle shortly, but we have a very special guest as well. We're also going to hear exclusively from the second ever black Bond girl, Gloria Hendry, who played Rose Carver in the 1973 hit Live and Let Die, alongside Roger Moore. So don't go anywhere. Hi there, and welcome to the latest GB News forecast from the Met Office. Cloud will thicken for many of us over the next 24 hours, turning damp, but the rain does ease later on. Now, we're going to see a weather system approach from the southwest associated with an area of low pressure that's forming at the moment. And that's going to push a finger of rain into much of Wales, southwest England, and then overnight Northern Ireland, southern, eventually central Scotland, as well as parts of the Midlands and East Anglia. Now, the far southeast, likely to stay mainly dry, 10 Celsius here, and the far northwest of Scotland also dry with clear spells, touch of frost as we start off Wednesday. That's the best place for any bright weather first thing. Elsewhere, a lot of cloud cover, those spells of rain continuing through the morning, turning heavy for a time across parts of Wales and northern England before eventually the rain fragments and pulls away. But it does tend to stay damp across this central swathe of the UK. A few showers elsewhere, but actually Western Scotland, Northern Ireland brightening up nicely, feeling fresh here but feeling warm in the southeast, where there will be some afternoon sunshine and highs of 18 Celsius. Thursday is a very different day. We start the day with outbreaks of heavy rain across the northwest, strong winds moving in as well. The rain spreading across Northern Ireland and Scotland during the morning and early afternoon, thickening cloud across England and Wales, but the rain not arriving here until much later on. Friday, a return to sunny spells and blustery showers, the heaviest downpours towards the northwest. Headliners. Tomorrow's papers tonight, every night from 11 p.m. Welcome back to Headliners. And Paul, we're going to get straight into Monday's mail for some good old fashioned traditional male breastfeeding. Yeah. Uh, to answer the question, what is the latest woke hell, Josh? Uh, Rao, as hospitals say, hormone filled milk from trans <laughs> women who were born male is just as good for a baby as the real thing. It's possible for men, if they pump themselves full of oestrogen, to grow larger breast tissue. And they often do... If or you just eat lots of burgers. But yeah, or... Yeah. <laughs> Easy bit, eh? Um, but... And once you've done that, it is, it is actually then possible to express or lactate some... A liquid. A liquid, OK? If to that liquid you then add another load of pills, medication, chemicals, whatever, that lactation juice 
can be fed to a baby. We don't really... This is not for the sake of the baby. The baby has no benefits from this whatsoever. The studies are very weak on it. Um, it's a bit worrying because... You know, when hospitals started indulging in, in homeopathy and having, a, you know, the NHS had homeo yeah. homeopathic um, hospitals, that was worrying because they're supposed to be a trusted authority. And before saying something like this, there should be an awful lot of study done. I want to show you this hospital. This is the necessary. University yeah, Hospital do. Sussex NHS Foundation Trust. That's who it is. And they have written one of the stupidest sentences that I have read on, aloud read in the two years that I've been <laughs> privileged to do this show. It says, the term human milk is meant to be neutral and not gender biased. <laughs> Yep. Wow. Yep. That's incredible. <laughs> yep. Oh, my God, we're laughing at you. I mean, and as someone says here, babies are not props. And that's the yep. scary thing. And no. when it's not when we're not focusing primarily on the health of a baby. No, but the uh, the, the, the feeling of a person doing it yeah. rather than it's, it's a bit of an odd way to go, isn't it? So. Well, King Charles's former butler, Grant Harold, on potentially Prince Henry being deported by Trump. That's next, but it's time now for our head to head. And after years of flirting with the idea of a woke James Bond to take over from Daniel Craig, producers of the new 007 film are now set to announce a straight white male for the job. British actor Aaron Taylor Johnson best known for his roles in superhero films Kick-Ass and Avengers, has reportedly been offered the role and will sign a contract this week, apparently. Aaron from High Wycombe in Buckinghamshire is a married man of two kids. And his selection is a slap in the face to those calling for the new Bond to be, you know, one of many things, maybe an ethnic minority or someone like that, who has rid themselves of 007's infamous womanising. But look, what do you think? Were producers right to choose a straight white male for 007 or was it time for a change? Let me know your thoughts. Email me gbviews at gbnews.com. Tweet me at gbnews. Make sure you take part in our poll. The results will follow shortly. But before we get into our debate, I'm very pleased to say I'm joined by a former Bond girl, Gloria Hendry, who played Rose Carver in the 1973 hit Live and Let Die alongside Roger Moore. Thank you very much for joining me. This is absolutely remarkable to have you on the show. It's much appreciated. I've got to ask your view on this then. So, look, every single year there's always talk about what are they going to do with Bond? What's the new Bond going to be? Who is it going to be? Should it be a woman? Should it be someone who's an ethnic minority? Should he be gay? What do you make of the idea now that we've got a, what appears anyway, another straight white male Bond? <laughs> I'm laughing. I'm just laughing, laughing, laughing. First of all, you don't know who is who. We're not in people's bedrooms. That's one. You think a man is a man or you think a woman is a woman. That is their business. So whoever you hire, you have no idea. Right. Okay. <laughs> but it doesn't matter because what you see is not what you get. Hey. You about to reveal something about a former Bond here? <laughs> not at all. I'm not at all. This who and like I can talking to you. I can't tell who you are. I have no idea. No. No. Exactly. Not all right. Unless we, um, the, unless we enter the bedroom and we begin to disrobe, you will begin to see the real person. Yeah. I mean, so my... it's not. A, it's none of our business. <laughs> no. No, I am also... I am, I am, I'm not that that was an offer. I am also happily engaged. And I'll be shouted at at home if I don't make that abundantly clear on national television right now. So thank you very much for that. Um, is that do you think but it was it maybe matter. time for a... Maybe time for a more visible change of Bond, though? You know, a fi an, an actual female Bond, an obviously female Bond, for example. Well, you know, again, what you see is not what you get, but you like the appearance of what you see. Fantastic. They have to be strong. They have to be come off like they're very brilliant. And matter of fact, everyone is unique. Everyone is unique. And it's according to your taste. Mm. That's what it is these days. It doesn't really matter. Everybody has their taste. So okay. what I think is fantastic and what you think is fantastic and who's doing the picking? I mean, for the general public, then you do a consensus, which is wonderful. When you do a consensus, you find out who is who people like. But at the same time, you have no idea of your selection. And that do, is, I can even I mean, go I've got, back I've got to, I, I'll ask you about this particular... This, 
particular rumoured bond, do, do, you, do you like what you see with this bond? Oh, my God, I love Roger Moore. I love Sean Connery. I love Piers Brosnan. And this gentleman that I see, he's gorgeous. All right. OK. Well, I'll tell you what, you better watch out. Um, Gloria, thank you very, very much. Uh, remarkable uh, interjection from you into this show, I must say. And I do hope to talk to you again very soon. You're amazing. All right, it's Gloria Andrew there. He started Live and Let Die. That was great. We could just end the show there. Now, doing battle on this is the editor of 007 magazine, Graham Wright, and author and commentator, Nikki Hodgson. Well, I mean, how to follow that, I suppose. Uh, Graham, I'll start with you. Um, right. So, uh, are you happy, or is it right that the we believe the new James Bond is going to be a, a straight white British man? Well, as it should be, yes. But the point is, it's all conjecture. Nobody knows whether uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson has been cast as Bond or not. It's until Eon Productions, the film makers of Bond, you know, and when, when they make their uh, big press conferences, which they always do for these kind of events, that's when we'll know whether he's got the role or not. There's all it's all fiction at the moment. OK. Nikki, do you think it was maybe time for a change? I mean, the reason why we're doing this is every single time there's rumours of new Bond, we all know the stories, it, it all comes out, you know, oh, it should be, should be someone more diverse, mm. and that can mean a whole range of things. But do you think it was time for something like that? Oh, yeah, I do. I think we're crying out for something more diverse, original, unique. Actually, it's interesting what Gloria was saying just then about you don't know what people are into. It's between them and the other person that they're with. I think we have this perception that everybody wants to see a straight white man doing straight white man things on film and actually that's that's nothing of the sort people's fantasies are very wide ranging even if they won't admit to them and they won't admit to wanting to watch things like that as we know from porn viewing habits so i think actually it was time to take a bigger risk also because the the coffers are swelling you know the money is in the bank already for the for the Bond franchise. And uh, creatively, it must be very dull to work on something where you're just trotting out the same character and in a very kind of uniform way year on year. Graham, we'll come back to that. I mean, in your, in your view, regardless of whether or not this particular chap is going to be the next Bond, I'm assuming in your view, James Bond is a straight, white British man, is he? Absolutely, always. OK. And, and what would you say to the idea that it's time for a change? It's utterly stupid. Right, man, a few words, Graham. OK. Um, Nikki, Graham thinks that's utterly stupid. No, I don't think it's utterly stupid. In fact, actually, I, I happen to know the son of a gentleman who is widely believed to be in the model for James Bond. Uh, Jamie McLean is called, his dad was called Fitzroy McLean, and he has a lot of stories about his dad that have never made the press that would definitely colour your view differently in terms of what he got up to when he was a diplomat, when he was an MP, when he parachuted into the Balkans at the end of the 40s to support Tito against the Nazis. So actually, if you look at the real people that inspired Bond, they're much more colourful and flamboyant in their personal lives than what Ian Fleming put down on paper. Oh, is that true, Graeme, do you think? Is that is that true? Maybe the Bond we see on our screens is not a true re reflection of, uh, of, of the actual man he really is? Well, he was a fictional character. He is a fictional character. And... Uh... Bond is portrayed in the films more or less as Ian Fleming wrote him. And that's all that needs to be done. The cinema going public that aren't interested in, nor do they would they accept it changed something that's been known for six years. If something's not broke, there's no need to fix it. And if you try to fix it in that way, when it doesn't need fixing, it could be box office disaster all around the world. Most ridiculous idea any human being come out with ever in history. The world. Well, it's strong stuff. Thank you very much, both of you. That is the editor of 007 magazine, Graham Rye, an author and commentator, Nikki Hodgson. So who do you agree with? As British actor Aaron Taylor-Johnson is reportedly set to become the next James Bond, were producers right not to choose a more diverse 007? Paul on access. When Ian Fleming wrote the Bond books, 007 was a white man and that's how it should remain. Martin says, if James Bond went woke, I'm sure nobody would watch. OK. Mick says, the job of an actor is to move beyond their own body and personality and take on a whole new role. A good actor is the sole requirement to play Bond. It doesn't matter if they're white, black, male or female. Your verdict is in. 88% of you agree that producers were right to not choose a diverse James Bond. 12% of you say they were not. Right. Well, coming up, 
As a Muslim message is broadcast on the King's Cross Station departure board for every day of Ramadan, is our secular society under threat? You will not believe the info that we're about to bring you on that story, that's shortly. But next in my Royal Dispatch, Prince Harry could be kicked out of the US by Donald Trump. Well, we'll have all of the latest on that, is what Trump said. Well, that shouldn't be a big deal because everybody doctors, you look at these movie actors and you see a movie actor and you meet him and you say, <laughs> is that the same person in the picture? Yeah, that's him saying that we should leave the Waleses alone. King Charles' former butler, Grant Harold, is on next. Don't miss it. Nana Queer. Weekends from 3 p.m. Should we put tobacco-style warnings on ultra-processed foods? Boris Johnson is calling on the government to do this. In this Daily Mail column, the former prime minister says that people don't know what they're feeding their families and there's too many extra ingredients. That's why I'm asking, should we put tobacco-style warnings on ultra-processed food? Well, joining me now to discuss, Steve Miller, former presenter of Fat Families, Helena Davidson, campaigner and policy expert at the Vegan Society. Right, so I'm going to start with you, Steve Miller. What do you think? Oh, I'm applauding Boris today. Good on you, mate. Uh, and the reason for that is we know that the research on uh, cigarette, you know, the warnings on cigarettes, I should say, when those warnings were visual, they worked very well. The second reason on a practical level is that we need to start stop looking and listening before we start, you know, grazing and putting mm. things in the trolley. And the third thing is that you know, these kind of signs or these warnings, I should say, are kind of hypnotic. They trigger the emotion. So they're much more likely to get people to think and, and maybe resist. Yeah, so the, at the Vegan Society, we're broadly in favour of increasing consumer knowledge um, when it comes to the nutri nutritional value of people's food. Um, but I think it's important to mention that ultra processed food isn't an issue that's exclusive to vegans. And whilst most meat alternatives will fall into the ultra processed food category, it largely depends on how we're going to look at how UPFs are going to be assessed because vegan um, alternatives that are fall under ultra processed foods, they're actually on average healthier than meat products or ultra processed foods that contain animal products. Really? So I think it depends on how we look at it. We might have to take a closer look at the nutritional profile of individual foods rather than the level of processing. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live, here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions, when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live, here on GB News, Britain's election channel. It's Patrick Christie's tonight on GB News. Still to come, are Ramadan readings on National Rail departure boards acceptable in Britain? But first, it's time for the Royal Dispatch. And Donald Trump's exclusive interview with GB News' very own Nigel Farage has shone new light on his unique relationship with the British monarchy. Trump was asked about Prince Harry's visa records and whether the Duke's self-confessed drug use could spell trouble for his future in the US. If he's lied on his visa form, He'll doesn't, lie doesn't, doesn't the truth need to come out? We'll have I to. Mean, should, should he get special privileges that nobody else does? No, and we'll have to see uh, if they know something about the drugs and if he lied, they'll have to take appropriate action. Appropriate action. Yeah. Which might mean not staying oh, in America. Oh, I don't know. You'll have to tell me. You just <laughs> have to tell me. Uh, you, would, you would have thought they would have known this a long time ago. You would. Well, I'm joined now by King Charles' former butler, Grant Harrell. Grant, welcome to the show. Should the Sussexes fear Trump's potential return to the White House, then? It's a, it's a different one to answer, Patrick, because you kind of think partly, possibly, they, they could fear him coming into power because... 
as you just said, it could be an investigation and which could result in Prince Harry coming back to the UK. But then the reality is that you'd like to think that if there was something wrong, if, if the visa C had been filled out incorrectly, that that would have already been addressed in the past and not, you know, when Trump comes to power. So I suppose, again, time will tell. Yeah, time will tell. I mean, the Biden administration appears to be doing everything they possibly can to keep the records of Harry's visa application secret. That could all come out. And Trump, I think, is a lot less sympathetic to Harry, isn't he? Mm, absolutely. I think this is the thing, obviously, um, you, you know, from what it appears, that he obviously gets on quite well with Biden. Um, and, of course, I think in the past, I mean, I think Trump has kind of do we see very much kind of spoken in a way that he obviously supports the crown and the late queen and the king. But when it comes to Harry, he's obviously got, um, how do we put it, reservations. <laughs> That's the way we to describe it, reservations. And which, but with Biden, it's, it appears to be very different. So he probably has, I mean, deep down, he probably does fear that if, if Biden um, comes out of power and, and Trump goes into power, that mm. might be something on his mind that he realizes that it could be, could be difficult. Has Prince Harry not been used to special treatment all his life? I mean, you saw the royals at close quarters, you know how it worked. And if it looks as though he might have got some special treatment on a visa application, he might be about to find out what no special treatment looks like in the shape of Donald Trump. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, you know, as you remember the royal family, you do get certain privileges and also with things like that, they're not going to, they, they shouldn't be kind of um, making things that are not fair for other people, just for them, if that makes sense. But. Mm. At the same time, that being a member of the royal family, you know, they, they would be given assistance with these kind of things, and you, you know, the office would look after this part of it, if you like. You know, I remember when I was in the household, you know, they they kind of take your passports and they organise your visas, your travel, all that kind of things. So, it's, it is something that's normally done by the household. But now that he's doing things on his own, if he has done something correctly, then of course, like any like you or me or anybody else, it's, it's filled out a form incorrectly. Um, there is rules in place that have to be kind of here to. Yeah, and, you know, I'm not sure that his lovely wife would particularly fancy joining him in the UK if indeed he is deported here. I would imagine that they'd probably have to find somewhere else to go as well. But look, the international media storm around Princess Catherine's health and photo editing ability has gripped the world in recent weeks. Donald Trump thinks it's all a bit of an overreaction. A photograph that the press say was doctored, now an enormous row. It, it's pretty tough being in her position, isn't it? it well, really that is. shouldn't be a big deal because everybody doctors. You look at these movie actors and you see a movie actor and you meet him and you say, <laughs> is that the same person in the picture? Uh, and I looked at that, actually, and it was a very minor doctoring. I don't understand why there could be such a, a I think she'll be that. back. I think she'll be back. She's hard. She's, she's, I mean, it's... It's a rough period that, you know, they're really, the they went family. after Look, well, Trump gets it, doesn't he? I mean, Trump seems to get the reality of the situation now. I, I think so. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because it has, it's obviously become this, this massive ongoing uh, media story. I mean, as you know, Patrick, I'm not even in the UK and I'm getting kind of a lot of information over here about people saying, you know, what's happening and, you know, about the photograph and is this a, such a big deal? And uh, and part of me kind of thinks maybe what Trump's saying is is you know everybody, which is kind of true. A lot of people, if not most people, edit pictures. I think the the reality is the, the biggest concern. It's not so much about the edits in the picture. It's just the fact that she hadn't. I was told the other day she hasn't been seen for quite a long time, and that's the concern. And I think people are just just worried, just worried about her really. Yeah, no, uh, indeed. I mean, I did say on the show yesterday that I thought that whoever had been running their PR had done an absolutely catastrophic job of it, created vacuum after vacuum that was filled with a load of bile and guff, to be honest mm. with you. But um, uh, look, just very quickly on this now, Donald Trump does seem to absolutely treasure the professional relationship he built up with our late Queen Elizabeth. And he didn't hold back when discussing the impact that he felt the runaway royals Harry and Meghan had on her before her death. Uh, she, you know, I would say, although she wouldn't show it because she was strong and smart, mm. but I would imagine they broke her heart. The things that they were saying were so bad and so horrible, and uh, she was in her 90s and hearing this stuff, I, I think they broke her heart. No, I it think, was horrible. I think they it really hurt her very but bad. If he's... Grant, we've not got long. Did they break her heart? 
difficult to answer, Patrick, but I mean, as a grandmother, if you were hearing the things that, that she'd have been hearing, I'm sure it would have, without question, affected in some way. Uh, whether Harry did that intentionally or not, I very much doubt it, but I think it's just, you know, sometimes when things are carried away, it can affect people and you may not realise how much it can upset people. But I'd like to think it didn't break her heart, but again, she didn't live that long, did she, after, after all this began, sadly. Yeah. Look, Grant, can I just say a massive thank you as well, dialing in from Vietnam for us here on Patrick Christie's Tonight. <laughs> Always a pleasure. It's Grant Harold there, former Royal Butler. Now, coming up, the BBC apologises to Reform UK for branding them far right, all while an extreme left-wing terrorist dodges the same treatment by the media. If you've missed that case, I'll bring it to you. Chart-topping music megastar turned freedom fighter Winston Marshall is on the show to give us his unrivaled analysis. But next... Just why was a Ramadan message broadcast on the King's Cross departure board and are exceptions being made in our secular society for Islam? That's next. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hi there, and welcome to the latest GB News forecast from the Met Office. Cloud will thicken for many of us over the next 24 hours, turning damp, but the rain does ease later on. Now, we're going to see a weather system approach from the southwest associated with an area of low pressure that's forming at the moment. And that's going to push a finger of rain into much of Wales, southwest England, and then overnight Northern Ireland, southern, eventually central Scotland, as well as parts of the Midlands and East Anglia. Now, the far southeast likely to stay mainly dry, 10 Celsius here, and the far northwest of Scotland also dry with clear spells, a touch of frost as we start off Wednesday. That's the best place for any bright weather first thing. Elsewhere, a lot of cloud cover, those spells of rain continuing through the morning, turning heavy for a time across parts of Wales and northern England before eventually the rain fragments and pulls away. But it does tend to stay damp across this central swathe of the UK. A few showers elsewhere, but actually Western Scotland, Northern Ireland brightening up nicely, feeling fresh here but feeling warm in the southeast, where there will be some afternoon sunshine and highs of 18 Celsius. Thursday's a very different day. We start the day with outbreaks of heavy rain across the northwest, strong winds moving in as well. The rain spreading across Northern Ireland and Scotland during the morning and early afternoon, thickening cloud across England and Wales, but the rain not arriving here until much later on. Friday, a return to sunny spells and blustery showers, the heaviest downpours towards the northwest, along with gusty winds. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Time is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel. 
Britain's News Channel. It's 10 p.m. I'm Patrick Christie's tonight. A pushback against the perceived Islamification of Britain after a King's Cross Ramadan message was deemed offensive. I reveal how we forced a network rail climb down next. Also... It's a nice bit of case. Need shot on the hundred cent. Left-wing anarchist sentenced for terrorism. Where's the media hysteria? Winston Marshall joins me live and... We need Labour to be brave, to not be cowardly at this moment. We need you to make a commitment. Emily Thornbury gets Just Stop Oiled. They've got classic Just Stop Oil names, by the way. Plus, find out which council has hiked up tax but splash the cash on rainbow walkways. I've got tomorrow's newspaper front pages with GB News star Nana Aquir, Tory MP Jonathan Gullis and author Amy Nicole Turner. And what the heck is this? I'm proud to be British. Aren't you? Get ready, Britain, here we go. Today, GB News forced Network Rail to climb down. Next. Patrick, thank you and good evening to you. The 10 o'clock news tonight is that earlier on this evening, Nigel Farage interviewed the former US President Donald Trump about America's commitment to NATO. Mr Trump said NATO has to treat the US fairly because without it, NATO doesn't exist at all. Asked if Poland would be defended, he made his position very clear. Yeah, but a uni the United States should pay its fair share, not everybody else's fair share. No, fair enough. I believe the United States was paying 90% of NATO, the cost of yep. NATO, could be 100%. Yep. It was the most unfair thing. And don't forget, it's more important to them than it is to us. We have an ocean in between some problems, OK? We have a nice, big, yep. beautiful ocean. And it's more important for them. They were taking advantage, and they did. They took advantage of us okay. on trade, and they took advantage on So if the they military. play fair, if they start to play fair, America's there. Yes, 100 per cent. Now, the first person to be convicted of cyber flashing in England and Wales has been jailed for 66 weeks. 39-year-old Nicholas Hawke sent unsolicited, explicit photographs to a teenage girl and a woman. The Justice Secretary described the offence as a distressing crime which couldn't be normalised and said the sentence sent a clear message that the behaviour has severe consequences. Now, four people have been hurt and a dog believed to be an XL bully has had to be shot by police in South London. A warning if you're watching on television, the following does contain some distressing content. Let's show you this video footage captured of the attack that happened last night at around 10 o'clock. A group of people desperately trying to stop the dog attacking one person, throwing a blanket over it at one stage. The four victims taken to hospital for treatment for non-life-threatening injuries. The Metropolitan Police saying a 22 two-year-old man and a 21-year-old woman have been arrested on suspicion of being the owners of a dog dangerously out of control. And Unilever is set to cut 7,500 jobs worldwide under its new cost-cutting overhaul. The Marmite and Dove soap owner, which employs around 6,000 staff in the UK, is cutting jobs in hope of saving around £684 million over the next three years. The consumer goods giant also said it would split off its ice cream business, which includes the Walls, Ben & Jerry's and Magnum brands, by next year. That's the latest news. For the latest news alerts, do sign up to GB News's QR code on the screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. It can sometimes feel like the Islamic faith is given more prominence than other religions in Britain. Today's example was the main concourse at King's Cross train station. It emerged that to commemorate Ramadan, Network Rail have been putting a hadith of the day. Today's message was from the Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. 
But it appears they've been doing it every day. This one reads, When Ramadan enters, the gates of paradise open. The gates of hellfire are closed. There was some stuff about sinners in there as well. Anyway, thousands of people took to social media to say that this seems a bit off. We are supposed to be a Christian country, after all. We also have Ramadan lights going up, which is a bit of a contrast to the perceived erosion of the word Christmas. We have winter markets now, don't we? British institutions changing Christmas exhibits to winter festivals, while universities refuse to use the word Christmas in case it offends non-Christians. We've also got adverts on buses around the UK at the moment. Give Zakat, which is apparently the Muslim charitable obligation. But when a guy wants to display a Union Jack flag outside his chip shop, he gets banned. We are absolutely fine in this country to have things like this. And it is fine. You know, it's an expression of religion in an open, free, democratic society. Absolutely no problem at all. But when a Christian preacher takes to the streets, they might be arrested. Preach in here, it also depends on what you say. Because you might be... Um, uh, you might be committing criminal offences as well. So, when we saw the Ramadan messages at King's Cross today, I wondered if it was another step towards, potentially, anyway, the Islamic faith being given promotion over other faiths, especially given the time of year that we're in. The overt promotion of one faith over another. Well, let's remind ourselves of the main concourse at one of the country's busiest train stations today. We've got the quote there on the screen. That is, of course, what it said. Well, we went to Network Rail and we asked them why they decided to put a reading like that on their board. And this is where it all gets quite interesting. So initially they said this, King's Cross Station is made up of a diverse and multicultural workforce and at times of religious significance, messages such as these are displayed to celebrate the station's diversity and inclusivity. Throughout the year, messaging at the station also celebrates festivals from other religions, including Easter, Christmas, Passover and Diwali, to mark the beliefs of our colleagues and passengers. But then we thought, oh, hang on a minute, it's Christian Holy Week coming up, isn't it? It's Lent, Easter's around the corner. Will they be doing something on that message board for Christians? So we asked them, will King's Cross Station display religious scripture such as this for other festivals going forward, starting from Easter weekend? Then as if by magic, they sent us this. We value the feedback of our passengers, and while these messages were intended to celebrate the beliefs and backgrounds of some of our colleagues and passengers, we have removed them. Over recent years, King's Cross has celebrated significant religious and secular events from all cultures, including Easter, Diwali, Passover, Ramadan and Remembrance Day. However, we will now review how occasions can be marked in the future. One way of looking at this is that they've responded to feedback, as they say. Another way of looking at it is that we called them out for virtue signalling to the Islamic faith when they had no intention of doing it for anyone else, and now they've pulled the plug. But then the plot thickens. Just minutes before we came on air, we had another message from Network Rail, and they said this. We celebrate all the big religious festivals from Christmas to Ramadan at King's Cross to reflect our diverse passenger and employee base. However, our main departure board should be reserved for train information and our general Ramadan celebratory messages weren't used for some reason, which we're looking into. All has now been corrected. So they're looking into why that message was even on their board. How did it get up there? Who did it? How did it go unnoticed seemingly for days? It seems like this message wasn't authorised. Was their arrivals and departures board hijacked? We await the results of their internal investigation. But let's get the thoughts now of my panel. It is GB News presenter Nana Aquir. We've also got Conservative Stoke on Trent North MP Jonathan Gullis and the author and broadcaster Amy Nicole Turner. Uh, Jonathan, the plot thickens here, doesn't it, really? I mean, do you think that maybe companies and corporations like Network Rail are just almost pandering to the Islamic faith more than more than other faiths, do you think? Well, I think there's lots more questions to answer because to have three different statements in the course of half a day, it seems, mm. is, is utterly bizarre for a start. Mm. And it's particularly the last message that you received. King's Cross say they celebrate other faiths 
I can't recall at any station seeing any significant messaging putting on board regarding Christian vessels, for example. As you rightly point out, we have a monarchy in our country, the king, who's also the head of the Church of England, as well as obviously technically the head of state, although be in a ceremonial role. Uh, I don't really recall in my community uh, seeing lights being held up or posted up to celebrate Christian festivals either. And I think it's a real shame. I think if we're going to celebrate all faiths, then all faiths should have that equal celebration. And it does feel like we live in a two-tier society where almost Christianity is something to be sort of ashamed of, whereas another faith should be overtly celebrated. Do, do you think that there was anything wrong with having that message on the departures board, Amy? I don't think I don't think any religious um, sermons should be on departure boards at train stations. I mean, I think when we go to the train station, what do we want? We want you know a toilet we don't have to pay for. We want a Burger King. <laughs> we want trains that run on time. I don't think we want to be told to repent. Um, the thing I found funny that I mm. pointed out earlier was um, all the trains to the left of this sermon were running late. Yes. So why can't they repent and sort that out? That's yeah. my question. Well, that is that actually sums it up perfectly, doesn't <laughs> it? No, it really does, because you have got clearly a f service that is not really functioning, mm. all right? But they decide to put on a departures board at one of the busiest train stations in the country a series of messages about... Ramadan and from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And your thoughts on this, whether or not that should have been up there? Well, look, look you know, if, if they're going to do that, they need to have a proper running service. I'd rather they focus on actually doing the job they're meant to be doing. So mm. get the trains running. If you're going to add those things in, that's great. But I, I do think that we do pander to all these uh, other religions because whilst we are, a, a, you know, a um, multi-faith country, mm. although we are obviously Christian, um, a lot of the other faiths have come from <clears throat> theocratic regimes where one faith is prominent and the others have to kind of be quiet. So in my view, I mean, you, you know, you tell that to the teacher who's still in hiding three years later from Batley and Spain. Yep. He dared to say something, you know, put a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad up and he got in trouble. So I think a lot of these, whilst we're very open and generous mm. to all the other religions, I think that, they, that that needs to be the reverse. We, as well. we've, got, we've got winter markets now, not Christmas mm. markets. You've got universities not using the word mm. Christmas just in case that offends anybody. What I will take by the way, and look, again, I will emphasise, Network Rail uh, <clears throat> would presumably deny this. They will say that they've been listening to feedback, etc., and that's why they've changed it. I do think it was quite interesting that the second we asked them then, and clearly they knew we would be watching, are you actually going to do anything for Easter? <clears throat> they decided to remove the statement <clears throat> from there as opposed to do anything for Easter. The implication that I'm taking from that, and I could be wrong about this, the implication I'm taking from that uh, is that they had absolutely no plans, really, to do anything Don't you think that's space. good? Like, I don't... But why was it just the one about <laughs> Ramadan? Because, people, because now this is turning into a little dog whistle again, isn't it? Like, I think everything Nana said, we, we, do, we, we are one of the most Islamophobic countries going at the moment. Have like, you been to any Islamic I, countries? I can imagine, I can imagine uh, Lee Anderson at King's Cross Station this morning having an absolute aneurysm over this. Have you been to any Islamic Countries. What's that got to do with well, what I'm said... saying? I'm talking about how we treat Muslims yeah, generally no, in, you, the, you in the UK. We, we and there's, most... there's so many stereotypes and you kind of wield all of but them we, out. When but you I mean, to be well, fair, we, question, we, we, haven't, we haven't done... I mean, it, Network Rail just decided to do this, isn't it? It's not up to anyone else. I mean, they just decided to put that up there and yeah. it is, and it caused quite a lot of... Could you see why people might have been a bit offended by it, Jonathan? Well, absolutely. I, like, I think Nana made the point earlier, as did Amy, to be fair, which is when I go to the train station, I want to know the information mm. about the train. So I don't want to have religious messaging like being pushed upon of me, to be religion. perfectly frank. I've got, of any religion on the, on the message board. I, if we, I think we should celebrate Christianity much more. Mm. I think the Archbishop of Canterbury should actually be preaching about God rather than trying to play God, as he seemingly does in the House of Lords, particularly over legislation regarding Rwanda, you know, and actually fixing why so few people in this country Country, every census that's conducted are saying they no longer perceive themselves to be Christian. That's very concerning for a yes. Christian country. And ultimately, there are Christians that are severely persecuted all around the world. We're actually in this country. We are very accepting. We are very tolerant. Exactly. We actually teach. I've literally well, taught <coughs> about Islam in the curriculum as much as I've taught about Christianity. <laughs> so I totally reject the idea that this is a <coughs> Islamophobic country. I mean, well, the, the UK is one of the least racist countries in the world, according to a massive new global study. The analysis from the Policy Institute at King's College London uh, forming part of the World Values 
survey. I don't know if it's a question of racism. I think it's a question of... Not racism. I didn't say racism. Yeah. I said I th there are certain amounts of Islamophobia you said within so we're this one country. one of the most Islamophobic countries well, in the world. Well, I, I actually think... Uh, well, maybe not country. in the world, but I do think right. we have problems with Islamophobia, which are always highlighted in conversations mm. like this, where we start to wheel out these tropes about Islam that perhaps... Well, is it, is it... Yeah, OK. I mean, Nana, is it not part of a, <laughs> a maybe a wider perceived thing, which does appear that potentially mm. the Islamic faith is often given you know, undue prominence when it comes to things like all right, fine, we've got the Ramadan lies, you've got the Archbishop of Canterbury talking about it. You've got people, there is a perception, maybe, that people are tripping over themselves mm. in some parts to try to... Uh, accommodate. Yeah, accommodate, yeah, maybe accommodate uh, Islamic communities in a way that they don't do with other religions. Well, I think we do it with a lot of things in this country because I think Britain is, uh, you know, the United Kingdom is an extremely generous country. You only need to look at how we, you know, how we treat people who come to this country, refugees, people who come in small boats. We give them more than we give a lot of our own veterans. So people coming in small boats, many will get hotels. Uh, some of them will, you know, they'll get everything paid for Might them. Might get Whereas, Oh, here we go, you've interrupted me now. I mean, I suppose there is also this, what appears to me to be an ongoing investigation by Network Rail, right, which is how the flipping heck this thing got on their departures board. Uh, and, you know, there will presumably be some kind of inquest into that as to whether or not their departures board had indeed been hacked or hijacked by this. But, look, coming up, a senior Tory tells GB News that MPs could move to topple Rishi Sunak as soon as this week. So should the PM be ousted? More of that and the first of tomorrow's newspaper front pages. But next... The BBC has apologised to Reformer UK for branding them far right, all while an extreme left-wing terrorist dodges the same treatment by the media. So is this proof that double standards are at play here? Rock star turned freedom fighter Winston Marshall gives his unrivaled take on that in just a tick. It's Patrick Christie's tonight. It's not to be missed. GB News Breakfast. Every day from 6am. Absenteeism and parents whose children miss a week or more of school face increased fines in a government drive to tackle absence. This is another one of those government policies which has done nothing to improve the education of our children. Mm. In fact, since this was originally introduced some 10 years ago, the educational standards for our children, the 11-year-olds who can't read when they go up to primary school, have got worse and worse and worse. So it's not working. So what do they do? They just increase the fine, like that may make it work. Most of the parents who get fined are taking their kids up so they can take them on a holiday before the holiday companies push the prices up. Mm. And frankly, as a parent, if I've got a £600 discount on my holiday versus a £60 fine, hmm. I'm mm. going to go for the 60 You'll suffer fine. the fine. Yeah. yeah. Let's not forget the other huge absence that children had uh, recently uh, during COVID. Mm. Schools were closed for months and months on end. Online learning was really not making up for that. Yeah. So how could... You know, it's very difficult for the government to say it was fine for us to take your kids out of school for, for months, but if you take them off for a few days to go to Disneyland, then you are the worst parent ever and you should be... But also, be it's, it's, it's the pandemic that, that caused some of the problems with absenteeism now. Absolutely. Because the mental health issues that some of these children now have. And there are tens of thousands of children, they, they call them ghost children, that have simply disappeared from the school register. So it that would be nice. It's, it's really, really scary situation. Um, I'm not seeing that the government is, you know, taking great measures well, to Well, I think that. one of Punishing. their plans is to have a national register, hmm. which, 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 which would help with that. Which would definitely help. But I think it, it's, it's almost... It's, you can't... Well, they can't deal with the real problem, so they're going after it's... actually perfectly, you know, decent parents who are just taking the odd day off, you know, for, to save money, frankly. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and, of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. 
with my panel here on Jubes & Co. We debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. All right, welcome back to Patrick Christie's Tonight. Tomorrow's newspaper front pages are coming very, very soon. But first, the BBC has been forced to release a grovelling apology after a news report on the corporation's website described Reform UK as far right. Now, whilst the fastest growing UK terror threat is apparently from the far right, left wing extremism is given a significantly easier ride in the British media. In fact, I would argue it's largely ignored. Take, for example, the left-wing extremist Jacob Graham. If you've not heard of him, well, it's probably because it wasn't really properly reported, in my view. He was yesterday jailed for 13 years for terror offences after declaring that he wanted to kill at least 50 MPs. But according to ITV News, he's a student anarchist. Of course, to the BBC, he's a Liverpool student. And, predictably, as per The Guardian, he's just a Liverpool teenager. Interesting. Well, I am joined now, with me here, is former Mumford & Sons musician Winston Marshall. Winston, uh, thank you very much. I mean, the details of this case are absolutely astonishing. I mean, this guy is a radical left-wing terrorist, right? And you wouldn't yeah, know well, that. Yeah, it's worth oh, just... Cool. Sorry. Yeah, go on, go on. It's, it's worth starting just uh, with a, a couple of interesting points. First of all, the bbc calling the reform party far right although they've now apologized keep in mind the bbc employ 60 people as part of their bbc verify team now we don't know how much they spend exactly on that but i thought that all news agencies all people in media should be fact fact checking as basic principle but maybe it's just they're letting slip something else maybe some of the mentality that's going on in bbc now before talking about the 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 what why that is exactly and what what ideas are at play in Westminster and media. This will also worth addressing extremism in the UK. This is something that's coming up again and again. Only at the beginning of this month did Rishi Sunak decry both Islamist and far right extremism. So, what is the case of extremism in the UK? According to MI5, there are forty three thousand extremists on their watch list. Ninety percent of which are Islamist extremists. They are jihadis that the MI5 have decided are necessary to monitor. That's 38,700 jihadis, sorry, 39,700 jihadis in the UK. So we're the, predominantly the extremists in the UK are Islamist, but we're told there's far right. Now, of course, there have been far right extremist incidents. Who could forget the mm. a horrible murder of Joe Cox in 2016? And of course, the Finsbury Park mosque attack in 2017. But far left extremism is completely ignored. This case of Jacob Graham is this guy's plotted to kill 50 people. He's now going to do 13 years in prison. OK, it might be a lone wolf example. However, we have seen very uh, far left groups on the streets of London, socialist and Marxist ever since October 7th, every week. Not only that, you will remember in, uh, it was March 2021, when various far left groups in Bristol attacked a police station, a police, uh, they tried to burn down the police station. A police officer had a lung punctured and several bones broken. The far left, that story doesn't get covered. That story doesn't get reported. It's completely ignored. I actually went to uh, one of Posey Parker, a woman who's constantly slandered and libeled as being far right. I went to one of her Let Women Speak um, uh, events and I saw the counter protesters. They were holding signs quite literally with Lenin on the placards. Lenin, who, as Robert Conquest, the um, historian noted, killed 
about 12 million people and began the great terror of the Soviet Union. He even started the gulags. Far left extremism is given a complete pass in the UK. It's ignored, but it's worse than that. When, let's say, if you remember, in Liverpool in February 2023, last year, uh, uh, an asylum seeker assaulted a 15-year-old girl. There were protests outside of the, the hostel where the asylum seekers were staying, where local Brits, working class people, came to protest. Now, those protests did get out of hand, but they were protesting something that everyone can agree was not good, the assault of a, of a minor. How did the media report on this? The Guardian called them far right. I recently interviewed Ayan Hirsi Ali, and she's made a very good point. Working class people are doomed if they do and doomed if they don't. They're doomed if they do protest uh, their girls being assaulted, they get called far right. They're doomed if they don't do anything because their girls get assaulted and no one does anything about it. The media class, and that means Westminster media politicians, whether they're conservative or Labour, they ignore it. It's the same thing. When you remember Rishi's uh, speech at the beginning of March, why did he mention the far right? It's not relevant. It's, it's got nothing to do with the extremism we've seen on the streets. Yes, there's been a rise in anti-Muslim hate, of course. Whether that's far right, not entirely clear. What is clear is that there is Islamist extremism and there is some far left, very small amount, but some far left extremism, which is completely ignored. Mm. And when there is far right extremism, it is rightly reported on, but it's the only thing it's reported on. My conclusion mm. in all of this is that it's political correctness that dominates everything. On the one hand, when there's Islamist extremists, politicians in the media, they try and they try both sides it. They say, yes, there's Islamist, but there's also far right. When there's far right extremism, it's the biggest story in the mm. world. And I would say it's very important that we call out far right extremism when mm. it comes up. But then when it's far left extremism, it's almost entirely ignored. Uh, look, Winston, thank you very, very much. That was a, a monologue there of epic proportions. This is Winston Marshall, uh, who is the former Mumford & Sons musician. Um, look, a spokesperson for the BBC said, in an article about the Liberal Democrats' spring conference, we wrongly described the political party Reform UK as far right when referring to polling. This sentence was subsequently removed from the article as it fell short of our usual editorial standards. While the original wording was based on news agency copy, which actually says a lot for itself, doesn't it? We take full responsibility and apologise for the error. We've had an example there of someone who I think, you know, could quite rightly be described as far left terrorist. Not a dot of it. But coming up, a senior Tory tells GB News that MPs could move to topple Rishi Sunak as soon as next week. So should the PM be ousted? Or, well, is Jonathan Gullis right to defend Rishi and plead for an end to the psychodrama? But next, my panel are back with me and we are going to hammer through those front pages. There is a shocking and quite sinister story concerning the Princess of Wales's medical records, which I am just finding out about now along with you for the first time. So stay tuned. Hi there and welcome to the latest GB News forecast from the Met Office. Cloud will thicken for many of us over the next 24 hours, turning damp, but the rain does ease later on. Now we're going to see a weather system approach from the southwest associated with an area of low pressure that's forming at the moment. And that's going to push a finger of rain into much of Wales, southwest England, and then overnight Northern Ireland, southern, eventually central Scotland as well as parts of the Midlands and East Anglia. Now, the far southeast likely to stay mainly dry, 10 Celsius here, and the far northwest of Scotland also dry with clear spells, a touch of frost as we start off Wednesday. That's the best place for any bright weather first thing. Elsewhere, a lot of cloud cover, those spells of rain continuing through the morning, turning heavy for a time across parts of Wales and northern England before eventually the rain fragments and pulls away, but it does tend to stay damp across this central swathe of the UK. A few showers elsewhere, but actually Western Scotland, Northern Ireland brightening up nicely, feeling fresh here, but feeling warm in the southeast where there will be some afternoon sunshine and highs of 18 Celsius. Thursday is a very different day. We start the day with outbreaks of heavy rain across the northwest. 
Strong winds moving in as well. The rain spreading across Northern Ireland and Scotland during the morning and early afternoon. Thickening cloud across England and Wales, but the rain not arriving here until much later on. Friday, a return to sunny spells and blustery showers, the heaviest downpours towards the northwest. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. From 10am every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. OK, welcome back. It's time now to bring you all of tomorrow's front pages. Let's do it. Here's the Metro for you. First, Cyber Flasher is jailed. Naked phone pics pervert behind bars thanks to a new law. OK. The I. Reeves, we won't repeat mistakes of new Labour. And if you're watching my show at 9pm, we hope they don't repeat the mistakes of actual Labour in <laughs> Wales either. But Shadow Chancellor outlines economic vision for Britain. Labour will not change Bank of England's 2% inflation rate. OK, OK, OK. The Daily Express. Prince focuses on driving forwards and not Kate rumours. William's getting on with a job. I think he was visiting a homeless charity earlier today, something like that. Now, this is one in the mirror, OK? This is quite extraordinary. It's a Royal World exclusive in the mirror, and they say Kate's medical records, security breach. Apparently, the clinic where she was treated is probing after staff tried to access her personal data. So, unauthorised staff tried to access Princess Kate's medical records whilst in hospital. The London Clinic has now launched a probe into all of this. It's a major security breach. It's damaging for the hospital. So, that's the latest there. OK. I mean, it's quite astonishing stuff, actually, uh, really. That I am joined, as ever, by my news hounds. It's GB News presenter Nana Queer, Conservative, Stoke on Trent North MP Jonathan Gullis, and author and broadcaster Amy Nicole Turner. We're going to start with this this just front page here, which is quite extraordinary in the mirror. Kate's medical record security breach. Uh, oh, Nana, I mean, this is, you know, something that really needs to be looked into, doesn't it? Someone mm. just trying to hack into her medical records. Well, I, I am quite surprised that somebody hadn't already hacked into them, if I'm totally honest. Yeah. Because it's, it's, they've managed to shroud this in complete secrecy, but it sounds like the story is people who are not actually authorised to get involved are trying to get access. So, you know, look, we've, we've made such a big deal over Kate. Is it her in the picture? Isn't it her? Is it a body double, this, that and the other? Um, I, I think, you know, I, I think we are really seeing the real dregs of uh, mm. behaviour with people actually trying to access medical records to get information on someone who's had surgery. It's, I think it's quite grim, really. They say here, the whole medical staff have been left utterly shocked mm. and distraught over the allegations were very hurt that a trusted colleague could have allegedly been responsible for such a breach of trust and ethics. Does it surprise you, Amy? Um, well, you know what? In terms of, like, no, not really, mm. because um, I read a lot around the time of Leveson and the type of things that mm. type of lengths that journalists would go to to get medical records because of the money involved. Um, this picture yeah. on the front, I heard it was in hundreds of thousands for that video. So then probably somebody read that figure and thought, oh, my goodness, I could maybe make a quick mm. bit of money, unfortunately. I agree. No, I, I, think, I think you are actually possibly spot on that the person who accessed the medical records there and was willing to part with that information was probably, you know... 
well, they could probably afford to lose their job and live very comfortably for a very long time, which is And the NHS are very depressing. poorly paid, you depressing, see. Depressing, <laughs> isn't it? Well, there we go. Um, right, OK, look, I'm, I'm moving on now because <coughs> the clamour for Rishi Sunak to fall on his sword is continuing mm. to grow. Uh, a senior Tory MP has told GB News' Christopher Hope that MPs could move to topple the Prime Minister as soon as this week. Rumoured leadership contender Penny Morden was giving nothing away as she left Cabinet earlier today. I'm getting on with my job and I recommend it. Do you think you will survive the next election? Oh, but in WhatsApp messages sent to Tory MPs group chat over the weekend, <laughs> tonight's panellist, Jonathan Gullis, <laughs> put his foot down. He said, enough of briefings to destabilise things or undermine the agenda slash PM. <laughs> I'm effing bored of it. I'm working my arse off without having to go back and forth on doorsteps about the psychodrama. <laughs> Thanks right, for using it? a good photo, by the way. Yeah, I really appreciate thing. that. I like that one. Yeah, but, I mean, there is clamour, isn't there, for him to go? Uh, whichever idiot gave that quote to Chris for Hope, they clearly haven't got a clue what's going on and they're, mor and they're a moron, and that's the nicest thing I can say about that individual colleague, probably, uh, live on air now. The reality is that people can try and convince themselves that things won't get worse. It will. The Conservative Party, if it changes leader for the fourth time within two years, <sighs> the British public will go <laughs> exactly like Nana's just done there. What on earth is going on with you? You are the clowns, as Amy referred to, that she thinks the Conservative Party already is. And we will be boot out of office, not just not just politely, to an extent we will have less than 100 MPs. Can I... The Conservative Party needs to rally behind right. the Prime Minister. Mm. He'll have my... He has my full support. Right. He's a good chap. He's working damn hard to try and deliver. And I trust him with my children's future more than I do with Sir Keir Do you think Tom Tugendhat's all right as a bloke? I like Tom. I like all my colleagues, well, apart from the idiots who say some of the things that they've I said mean, the, to the reason Chris why, The reason why I ask is that there is a story on the inside of The Telegraph which is apparently... A core group of right-wing oh, Tory no. MPs. Yeah. Who? Who? Name them. Uh -huh. Who are these? Openly folks? discussed ousting Rishi Sudak and uh, replacing him God. with a unity candidate <laughs> such as Tom Tugan. Right, so let me tell you, Patrick, I've hardly ever been referred to as a centrist in my time in Parliament, OK? So as a member of the right, as it's described in the media, mm. yeah. I'm not in these rooms, I've not heard these chats, and it's for the birds. Tom is a great colleague, someone I really like, as is Penny Warden, as is many other people. But we are going to get behind, and we are getting behind Rishi Sunak, a few agitators behind the scenes simply don't care about this party, which I've been a member of since the age of 18 years old. Mm -hmm. I've been a council candidate, I've been a councillor, I've been an MP candidate and an MP, I've been an association officer. Mm -hmm. I have lived through thick and thin with this party, I've swallowed a <laughs> lot of rubbish at times, things I'm not necessarily <coughs> liking. There are certain things we're doing in government that I don't, I'm not always totally proud of, but mm -hmm. the Conservative Party is the vehicle to deliver centre-right government that I firmly believe is needed and it will be needed for this country's future. And those Town's opposite in the Labour mm. Party. There's no Blunkett, there's no Blair, there's no Brown, there's no Molan. Those people who I disagree with were still, as I respected them as political giants. Yeah. You know, when I look at Yvette Cooper, David Lammy, Wes Streeting, give me strength. Angela Rayner. Angela Rayner, God help this country <laughs> if those not get in charge. But how can you say all that when your results have been so terrible? But have they? Let's look at Stoke on Trent North as an example. No, not, right? not, not, not your Because it's really important to remember that I had 70 years of doom and gloom under Labour, but yet I've had money for Kidsgrove Sports Centre to be refurbished and reopened, which Labour shut in 2017 because they couldn't be bothered to spend a pound to save it. Right. I've got 30 million to improve my but bus services, which have now I got fares for down a third I think, cheaper. I think Amy's making the. But I don't want to put words in your mouth here, but I think you're making the point that you, you're quite far behind in the polls. Not, not, you. not your constituency. We're not talking about your yeah, constituency yeah. personally, like the, part, the, just the party as a whole. But I think most people at home, not at home, not the people watching this programme, but like, for instance, my family, they don't know Tom Tugendhat. They don't know Penny Morden. They just know the Conservative Party. Which is fair. And I think when you chuck around these names, it proves that there is a Westminster bubble because most people aren't familiar. They know Penny right. Morden as the woman that well, helps and, I, and I personally think this is plotters, most of whom are ex special advisors and aides, mm. who are simply trying to stir okay. things who don't actually have any allegiance to the Tory party they just want to kill the Tory party and I hope we can one day get them fully named ashamed and whoever's backing them well, needs to be named true. ashamed too. One thing I would, yeah, one thing but, but listen well, let's quickly. be honest Jonathan if they are not rats leaving the sinking ship they're busy rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic it's so embarrassing I, I, I just literally I, the fact that this has even become a rumour and the fact that I tell you now I'm sure somebody somewhere within that party is talking about removing Rishi Sunak because I had Andrea Jenkins on here saying that actually it would be better to try and bring Boris back they're even talking about doing that so yeah. I'm afraid okay. this is this is something that they're planning All right.
Right. They are planning. We look. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna park that there for now. Why? Because residents in Blackpool woke up to a blinding surprise recently. They discovered their traditional zebra crossings have been upgraded to incorporate a rainbow flag. The progress flag, commonly associated with the LGBTQ plus community, has been added to two crossings on the town's Dixon Road as part of the local council's <laughs> "Be Who You Want to Be" initiative. <laughs> this is the same council that has just hiked Blackpool's council tax up by five percent for the second year running despite residents facing 16 million quid worth of cuts from the annual budget. Good grief. Anyway, still plenty to come, including more front pages, but there's also still plenty of time to grab our spring prizes in the Great British Giveaway. That's a shopping spree, a gadget bundle, and an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash. You've got to be in it to win it. Here's how. Time is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and Privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. OK, good luck. Coming up, he was elected on a pro-Palestine ticket. So why didn't the new Rochdale MP, George Galloway, attend the urgent questions for Gaza? In the comments, we investigate in tonight's greatest prison union, Jackass. Next, will you be taking political advice from this British-hating drag queen? I'm proud to be British. Aren't you? Right, more of that when I have the rest of tomorrow's newspaper front pages. It's Patrick Christie's tonight. We're on GB News. Dubes and Co. Weekdays from 6 p.m. Get this right. We all know by now, don't we, that so many uh, NHS workers are abused by people that they're trying to help. We'll all agree that that is pretty damn disgraceful. But what do we do about it? Because now uh, some London hospitals are looking at whether or not they should be able to ban people that do this for a year from those hospital facilities. Is that the way forward? Daniel, do you like this? No abuse, no excuse. That is the campaign. There's no other choice for most people. It's either the NHS or nothing. And if you're going to take that monopolistic power, then, then you need, I think, you have responsibilities towards people. You can't cut them off. So there are ways in which, I of course, oh. you can bring criminal charges against them. Uh, if they commit a criminal offence, that's fine. They might even be locked up in jail. But what you can't do is cut off health services because you're the only supplier. Well, yes, Peter? I think you can cut it off and you should cut it off. London is very different from everywhere else, and it goes back to a conversation about immigration. The majority of nurses in London are either African or Filipino, and it harks back to their nature and their culture. When you're younger, your parents look after you. When you're older, you look after them. They don't go into homes. So there's a way that a threshold of tolerance they have that is above and beyond most people. So, cos I found, like, when I was younger, most of the nurses were white. Now they work in hospitals in Ascot and Somerset. London is the war zone. I have seen horrific things happen to nurses, and they stay, they show up for work. There's a protection they are owed, beyond owed. And if you abuse, if you abuse something that's offered to you as a part of your citizenship, you should be, there should be a penalty for that. For the same reason, you. if you're you obliged to use if you it. Commit, there's no offer involved in and, the NHS. But it is, no, but there is an offer, because at there the end of the day, like, you, earn, you figure out how to get money and go private. So just because you've created something right, that so gives that's you the no, solution. no, it's easy. If you it's see, that's easy, that's an impossible solution. They've created something people. that's kind and easy and beneficial to all, indeed. But it's a good thing for all. Do not abuse it. That simple. I have more front pages for you now. Let's do it. It's the sun. I saw Kate with my own eyes. When will trolls lay off? This is a shopper who filmed the royals. I tell you what, this guy went to a farm shop and he's now on his way to being a millionaire, isn't he? And no one else is taking photos at the time. And, yeah, 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 OK. Weird, huh? All right, there we go. So, The Times, <laughs> The Times. 
Clinic staff attempted to access Kate's private notes. Well, hang on a minute. Let me just cast our minds back very quickly to the mirror. Royal World exclusive. You don't have to bring it up, don't worry. The mirror lab with Royal World exclusive. Well, it's not exclusive, is it? Because the Times have got the same story <laughs> and slapped it on the front page. Clinic staff attempted to access Kate's private notes. Hospital investigates alleged story breach. Um, right, look, Trump as well. US will 100% stay in NATO if Europe plays fair. That is a quote on the front of the Times from our very own Nigel Farage interview. Let's go to the Daily Mail. Ah, oh, I'll tell you what, this Mirror's World exclusive is an absolute shocker, isn't it? Staff at Kate's Hospital tried to access her records. Security breach fear for Princess of Wales. Uh, there we go. The Guardian. They've gone for social media blame for surging young people hit by a midlife crisis. I'm intrigued by this story, because how can you be hit by a midlife crisis if you're 15 to 24 years old? But there we go. Apparently, young people are less happy than they used to be. Um, UK's asylum proposals cost more than hotels as well. The Telegraph now. Diversity drivers backfired, warns Badenoch, um, when... Well, sorry, white men need consideration as much as black women under inclusion policies. That's what Kemi Badenoch has said. OK, right, there we go. So, yes, heck of a lot to go out there on the front pages. I am joined, as ever, by my press pat and GB News presenter, Nana Aquia, Conservative Stoke-on-Trent North MP, Jonathan Gullis, and author and broadcaster, Amy Nicole Turner. Right, now... The deranged Britain-hating lovies try all sorts to express their disdain for our great nation, but a left-wing drag queen known as Bimini took it to a whole new level. I'm proud of the Tories' energy strategy, where relying on unstable international markets has meant a skyrocket in your pocket. Who cares about the four million children that go to bed at night hungry? The 8 million people on a waiting list to see a GP just shows our dedication and resistance. The NHS might be on its knees, but who needs healthcare when you've got a fetish for dominance? I'm proud to be British. Aren't you? I watched that in the office earlier, and now I've made you do it. Nana, are lefties who put Britain down for online clout just useful idiots for leaders like Putin? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, look. Yeah, it, what? I, I, I think they What's are. What's that question? <clears throat> well, I think they are, because even Vladimir Putin kind of was laughing at us in this country, the fact that we're obsessed, apparently, with culture wars and all the other woke nonsense <laughs> that is going on here. I just think, you know, if, if you want to put Britain down, you know, if you don't like it, then clear off. Not a win. Jonathan, what were you doing outside down outside? All right, I'll go I'll come back to you. Oh right, so, uh, Amy, well I mean, you, 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 you well were clapping. Done, well you were yeah, the Queen thing. is alive. Saying yas queen as a yeah. What, well, what, the, I think I think the, the interesting thing is all they did was was repeat a load of facts. So Talk you're just angry at fact. Talking down Britain, talking down talking this down country, Britain, like, every yeah. opportunity. By saying the status quo, did they, did they, telling the truth. Did they explain about the, the strikes in the NHS that have led to the backlog? Which, by the way, which like, was already seven million. <laughs> so themselves now, have already pointed 10. out for that being a major drive. In fact, the head of the OBI himself pointed that to being a major factor in mm -hmm. the NHS, you know, needing additional funding. Did this individual talk about the war in Ukraine, which has led to a spike in uh, oil prices? Did Jonathan, they lead? It's did they talk about It's just a funny COVID? video. No, it's, Don't it's, be so it's, joyless. I'm just, Come on. Oh, God, I can't All that stuff is true. Well, I mean, I suppose... And well, they're These brilliant. are the people that go into schools and, like, Do you know what? That's patriotism. Stories. Really? Because, because they're saying... Look, I love Britain and I want well, it to it improve, like rather than Jack burying Bikini. their head in the sand and being like, everything's fine, here my union jack is, which is all you lot do, to be honest. OK, well, I love the union <laughs> flag and I'm very happy to wave it at every opportunity you're to me. Even when the country's gone to the dogs. Do you think, I mean, do, do, were, they, do you, were they just pointing out facts <clears> there in an artistic way? I mean, the, the, the medium of TikTok is that, is that a lot of people will have seen that video, probably mm. millions of people. Does that concern you or not? Look, look you know, you, you could, it would be better to put a positive spin on this country because this country is actually quite incredible. They are I mean, the positive no... spin. They are the positive yeah. spin. There's, Why are they call that? Are they, oh, is that they? Is it, I there's literally, that there's literally no country. It, if you is go, it he any, or they? go to any other countries well. around the world where they'll give you hotels for the migrants and all well. the generous things that we do for people who come to this country, I think this country is fantastic. Do you think it's disrespectful outside Buckingham Palace yeah. to walk around looking like that? I think it's amazing. Do you? Yeah, I think it's fantastic. All right. Well, uh, anyway, <laughs> now the middle class brat oh. just the oil mm. paid Labour's Emily Thornbury a visit during an oh, institute for government talk after she dared. 
to ignore... So they posted a letter through a door last week, right? Here, here we go. I have met other people from... I'm very sorry to interrupt. No, go on. Um, oh, okay. the government not, not acting okay, as, we go. as it should. Uh, we need Labour to be brave, to not be cowardly at this moment. We need you to make commitments. Wait, right. Can we just replay? Just so we can see the moment exactly where the hope fades out of Emily Corbyn's <laughs> eyes. I have met other people from... I'm very sorry to interrupt. No, go on. Um, okay. the government... <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, right. Oh, That's God, exactly how I feel every time <laughs> Nana interrupts me. Oh, <laughs> oh here we go. The here only we... person that's been doing the interrupting is you, Amy. All right, let's stay on topic. All right. Yes, yes. So uh, this is what she had to say after the eco-activists were escorted out. I have just stopped oil outside my house. I have Gaza protests pretty much everywhere that I go. I'm quite happy to argue the issues. I am not prepared to be told that I'm responsible for the murder of babies in Gaza <laughs> or that I am personally responsible for boiling the planet. And I'm not happy. Right. So, can we guess the names of those really lovely, middle-classy, just up oil people? <laughs> Casper and Genevieve. Uh, Casper not. and Genevieve, Jonathan. Look, this, sure? is the, this is the <laughs> quinoa scoffing, <laughs> chai latte slurping, mm. metropolitan elite from North London, more than likely, who are yet again trying to impose their ridiculous, radical extremist mm. agenda upon everyone else. They want us to be colder, they want us to be poorer, whilst China, whilst Russia, whilst India, whilst the United States of America crack on doing what they need to do to create economic growth, to look after their people, to bring prosperity to their nations. These people are either need to go so see then, someone urgently or locked to be locked up. They're, they're not the used to. They're not. They're not used to somebody, you know, really dealing with them properly. Could you imagine mm. this exact same scenario? And it was black people throwing black men were thrown. They would be heavily, you know, there would be some sort of serious arrest. So, uh, you know, I think they're well, just. Well, a lot of them are in prison. Casper well, and even Genevieve. Whatever, but, you know. right. We have just about got time to reveal today's greatest Britain and Union jackass. Yes. Right, we're going to have to be quick with this. Nana, who's your greatest Briton, please? It's got to be Princess Catherine for putting up with the tosh that she's had to deal with over the last few weeks. Yep, OK, all right. So, Princess Catherine is a fantastic shout, isn't it, mm. to uh, get us going, I think, with the greatest Briton in Union, Jack Astor. Patrick, I forgot. I'm, uh, Jonathan, <laughs> Jonathan, I'm not gonna, I, believe, I'm not gonna... I believe that you've named football fans as your Yes, I have. Uh, thank you, yeah. Patrick, because the football fan... because uh, the football governance bill came out today. That's because fans were brave enough to stand up to the European Super League and that's why governments acted. Well Good. done. Good. All right, Amy, who's your greatest Briton? Um, Bimini. Hopefully future uh, PM. Yeah. The oh. future Bimini Bon <laughs> Bimini Bon Boulash. OK. Um, well, today's greatest Britain is football fan. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Well, I had a brain fart on there. I had a brain fart on there. It's a, it's a good job. It's a good job that we managed yeah. to, uh, to get that. And, and, and they've obviously managed to overturn things like the European Super League. Mm. Thank God. So, so good stuff. Right now, we're going to go to Union Jackass. Nana. Right, so mine is Femi Nylander for uh, inferring that black women wear wigs to appease white people. We've got a clip. Uh, so, We've got a clip. Yeah, so we can see... We... ...directly to you, Nana, now. Not to GB News and not to Patrick. But no matter how many, no matter how many wigs you wear, no matter how many um, oh, times you throw your fellow black women under the bus, as you did on yeah. the show the other day... Nana, your thoughts on that? Well, you see, that's just typical. I mean, in, in a sense, he's being racist, isn't he, really? And inferring that I wear a wig because I want to appease white people. I wear a wig because I enjoy it, but this is actually an Afro-style wig, so it's like my Afro hair. Mm. And I actually wear a wig to protect my own hair. But that's why I just okay. think it's typical of somebody who uh, pro professes to be, you know, dealing with racism and yet will come out with a comment that, in my view, is racist and offensive and actually throwing all, right. all black women under the bus, saying that we wear wigs to appease white people. All right, go on to another. Mine's the Labour Party, Patrick, because they used all of yesterday to vote against legislation so we could deport people to Rwanda who have entered our country illegally because simply what they love is open borders and free movement. OK, all right. So Jonathan's mentioning the Labour Party there. Didn't forget that one, did you, mate? Um, <laughs> and, we've got, and we've got Amy Nicole Turner's... Amy Nicole Turner's Union Jackass. Um, oh, it's the cat in the hat. So he said he won Rochdale. This is for Gaza. But today failed to turn up to the urgent questions for Gaza. <laughs> OK. The cat in the hat. 
Oh, all right. Yeah. Well, that's, come on, I won't, I won't he, use he that in Parliament. So just the cat on Big Brother. OK, so just to kind of a very quickly. So he didn't turn up today? So. No, he didn't ask. He, didn't, he wasn't there, was it? You're right, I didn't see him at all today. Wow. OK, all right. Look, today's winner of the Union Jackass is the Labour Party. There we go. All Fantastic. right, well done, Labour. Although, you know, we could have potentially all been worthy winners. Right, thank you very, very much, everybody, for an incredibly lively show. I've enjoyed it. I know our viewers and our listeners have as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I will be back tomorrow from... From 9 p.m., of course, with hopefully another rip roaring show for you. Headliners are up next. They're going to take a deeper dive into all of tomorrow's newspaper front pages. Please do go back, re watch any of the highlights back on social media. We've got YouTube, we've got Twitter, we've got all sorts to so make sure that you do that. And of course, tell your friends as well. Until tomorrow, keep fighting the good fight. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hi there and welcome to the latest GB News forecast from the Met Office. Cloud will thicken for many of us over the next 24 hours, turning damp, but the rain does ease later on. Now we're going to see a weather system approach from the southwest associated with an area of low pressure that's forming at the moment. And that's going to push a finger of rain into much of Wales, southwest England, and then overnight Northern Ireland, southern, eventually central Scotland, as well as parts of the Midlands and East Anglia. Now the far southeast likely to stay mainly dry, 10 Celsius here, and the far northwest of Scotland also dry with clear spells, touch of frost as we start off Wednesday. That's the best place for any bright weather first thing. Elsewhere, a lot of cloud cover, those spells of rain continuing through the morning, turning heavy for a time across parts of Wales and northern England before eventually the rain fragments and pulls away. But it does tend to stay damp across this central swathe of the UK. A few showers elsewhere, but actually Western Scotland, Northern Ireland brightening up nicely, feeling fresh here but feeling warm in the southeast, where there will be some afternoon sunshine and highs of 18 Celsius. Thursday is a very different day. We start the day with outbreaks of heavy rain across the northwest, strong winds moving in as well. The rain spreading across Northern Ireland and Scotland during the morning and early afternoon, thickening cloud across England and Wales, but the rain not arriving here until much later on. Friday, a return to sunny spells and blustery showers, the heaviest downpours towards the northwest, along with gusty winds. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax free cash. Text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Mark Dolan tonight. Weekends from 9 p.m. I've personally been very torn on whether Prince Harry should have full police protection when he's in the United Kingdom. On the one hand, why should taxpayers fork out for somebody that's left the country and the institution? He is no longer a working, serving royal. But I don't think it matters. He is one of the most famous men in the world, and whether he's a royal or not, he is an ambassador for this country. And he still does good. Charitable causes, the Invictus Games, and he is still a nice and charming guy with a heart. And whilst he has left the royal family and departed these shores, he was and remains the son of King Charles. That is a biological fact. Well, Let's hope so. And it wasn't his choice to be born into royalty. It wasn't his choice to be the son of the king. And for that reason, I think he should have equal police protection to his brother William when he is in this country. 
He couldn't be a more high-profile figure, and unfortunately, like all the royals, Harry will be a target for some very bad people. I fear that if, God forbid, anything happened to him or his family, the authorities would have blood on their hands. So, it's not often that I back Prince Harry, but on this one, he has my support. Look what happened to his poor mum, killed in a Paris tunnel in the 1990s with an allegedly drunk chauffeur. A top royal security insider recently told me that Diana would still be with us today if she had had top royal protection at that time. So let's not make the same mistake twice. Prince Harry needs full protection and the best we've got. Yes, he might be a numpty, but he's our numpty. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. It's 11 o'clock, you're with GB News, I'm Polly Middlehurst and we begin this bulletin with some breaking news uh, coming to us concerning the Princess of Wales. We understand an investigation has reportedly have, had to be launched at the London Clinic over claims that staff there tried to access the Princess of Wales' private medical records. The Mirror newspaper has reported that at least one member of staff tried to access Kate's notes while she was a patient at the private hospital in central London in January. Of course, we know Princess Catherine was admitted to the hospital for planned abdominal surgery at the beginning of this year and has been recovering at home ever since. She was seen out with her husband, the Prince of Wales, uh, at a farm shop in Windsor at the weekend. But that investigation has been launched at the London Clinic after one member of staff reportedly tried to access her private medical records. We'll bring you more on that, of course, as that story develops throughout the rest of the week. Now, in other news tonight, former US President Donald Trump has hinted he could deport Prince Harry if he wins the US election. In an exclusive interview with Nigel Farage tonight, he said the Duke of Sussex won't be getting special privileges if he lied on his visa about drug use. If they know something about the drugs and if he lied, they'll have to take appropriate action. Appropriate action? Yeah. Which might mean not staying oh, in America. Oh, I don't know. You'll have to tell me. You just have to tell me. <laughs> Uh, you, would, you would have thought they would have known this a long time ago. Mm, you would. But I thought they were very disrespectful to the family, to mm. the royal family. I'm a big fan of the concept of the royal family and the royal family. Now, I'm a little prejudiced because I thought the Queen was incredible. Trump speaking to Nigel Farage earlier on this evening. Now, in other news today, the first person to be convicted of cyber flashing in England and Wales has been jailed for 66 weeks. 39-year-old Nicholas Hawke sent unsolicited, explicit photographs to both a teenage girl and a woman. The Justice Secretary described the offence as a distressing crime which couldn't be normalised and said the sentence was meant to see it send a clear message that the behaviour had severe consequences. The supermarket giant Tesco has lost an appeal in a row with its rival shop Lidl over the use of a yellow circle logo. Lidl had accused Tesco of deliberately trying to ride on the coattails of their reputation by using the yellow circle to promote its club card scheme. Tesco denied infringement and took a challenge to the Court of Appeal last month. And a ruling was handed down today. The court dismissed Tesco's appeal, meaning they'll now have to switch to a new club card logo within the coming weeks. And lastly, Britain's roads are at breaking point as pothole numbers reach an eight-year high. A report found just 47% of local road miles were being rated as being in good condition, with 36% in an adequate condition, but 17% rated as poor. The Asphalt Industry Alliance said councils were expected to fix two million potholes in the current financial year. The amount needed, though, to fix the backlog of local road repairs has reached a record £16.3 billion. That's up 16% from a year ago. That's the news. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen right now or go to gbnews.com alerts. Now... 
It's time for Headliners. Hello and welcome to Headliners, your first look at Wednesday's front pages. On this occasion, I am your host, Simon Evans. Joining me tonight, two comedians, a man of faith, Josh Howey, and a man of science, Steve N. Allen. Yes. So, this could be the final clash. <laughs> clash Finally, we times. sort it out. Yes. Well, plenty of stories to uh, feed into both your specialisations tonight and possibly even encourage some cross-pollination. Who knows? Oh, I'm, not, yeah, I'm not in favour of that. <laughs> a few other stories as well, actually. Let's take a look at Wednesday's front pages. The Telegraph kick us off. Diversity drive has backfired, warns Badenoch. The Guardian social media blame for a surge in young people hit by midlife crisis. Express Prince focuses on driving forward and not Kate rumours. The Metro first cyber flasher is jailed. Uh, the first one to be jailed rather than the first one to do it. And iNews Reeves, we won't repeat the mistakes of new labour. Daily Star, world goes mad after a woman goes shopping. That's their ironic commentary on the Kate Farago. Those were your front pages. So we will start with the Daily Telegraph. Josh. Yeah, very quickly, one of their side stories, HMRC to shut phone helplines for six months every year, which will be... Uh, I think quite uh, interesting information for a lot of people who didn't know that they were open six months a year yeah. at the moment. Rough, Trying to get through is a nightmare. Rough, those six months are not evenly distributed across yes, the year, it's, right? It's you just have to see... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Two to four in the morning. <laughs> so I've been trying to get through for, lit for probably about six months now, actually. Really? Anyway, yeah, it's, yeah, it's crazy. Anyway, diversity drive has backfired, uh, warns Bednock, uh, with the subtitle of uh, white men need consideration as much as black women under inclusion policies, I'd say white men need more consideration. Mm. No. <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah, she's basically saying that a lot of this stuff, this diversity, uh, a lot of this, there's, there's a lot of money in it, and it's arguably a waste of money. This is what some studies are showing, that it's not leading to the divide, uh, desired outcomes. Yeah. And in some cases, it's backfiring, and also in terms of focusing on, like, for example, white working-class men, who seem to be pretty hard done by. Society. Well, certainly, uh, white working-class boys are not showing particularly good educational attainment and so on at the moment. That seems to be a, a genuine worry that nobody's very keen to talk about. I mean, this isn't a new thing, though, is it? <clears throat> We've had um, implicit bias testing and so on for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Seem to be on endlessly cycling through methods to try and address something that is resilient. Yeah, I mean, there are things like unconscious bias, which if you get a psychologist talking about it, it might mean something. Mm. Move it into a sociologist and all of a sudden it's a waste of time. Mm. Um, so those things I don't necessarily agree with. I think there's, there's so much fascinating detail within this subheadline. So white men need consideration as much as black women. You can argue about the as much, mm. but the idea that both groups need consideration is interesting. But white men aren't this one single homogeneous lump. No. If you are from a privileged background... Well, some of them are. Well, yeah, I've, I, some of them, yeah. You they, all look the same way. to me, to be honest. But some of them are so privileged. You know, if you go to... Yeah. You're privately educated, you stand a darn good chance of running the country. If well, you this fall... is something I've, I've said previously. Do you know Afua Hirsch? She's a Guardian commentator, I think Ghanaian-born or half Ghanaian, but privately educated at Wimbledon School, went to Oxbridge and now writes columns about diversity and so on in, in The Guardian. And they make me bristle with indignation because she has had vastly more privilege than I have, for mm. instance. And and I suspect that neither of you. No, no, no. You're still upset okay. that you didn't get in. I yeah. definitely beat her. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, she's allowed to write about these things, but the implication is that she knows whereof she speaks. This yeah. is the... I agree with you. Wealth, power, privilege, a stable family, these things are privileges. Class is still dominating. Ex 